Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that those of you who were able to attend the dinner last night at the restaurant Tuljak really enjoyed it. It's my pleasure to welcome you all in Tallinn. Dear colleagues, this chairperson's meeting opens the parliamentary dimension of the Estonian Presidency of Council of the European Union. Therefore, it creates an excellent opportunity to give an overview of the priorities of the Estonian Presidency and to address very topical issue within EU. And now, I am pleased to give the floor to the President of the Rigigogu, Mr. Eiki Nestor, who will like to welcome you here on behalf of our Parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's nice to see you in our holy room, the plenary room. A warm welcome to you all on behalf of the Parliament of Estonia. When I started preparing for today, I realized that the COSA could be compared to a social startup that has succeeded in becoming a social scale up. How did I reach such a peculiar conclusion? It has nothing to do with the fact that our conference today focuses on the topic from startups to the scale ups use unused potential. Firstly, please think for a moment about the broader definition of startup. A startup is at its seed stage an idea or concept. Also, the Cossack was at its early stage just an idea. This idea, this idea was brought alive in 1979 by parliamentarians from the 10 member states of the European Community as well as the European Parliament. At that time, the European Affairs Committees from the national parliaments reaffirmed their desire to be closely involved in the decision-making process of the European Community. One way to achieve this was to organize an interparliamentary conference where parliaments meet on a regular basis and debate topics of common interest. And thus, COSAC was born. Secondly, I would like to point out a mistake that startups usually make and that I believe the creators of COSAC avoided. Startups often fail to understand the importance of so called nitty gritty. As we all have noticed from time to time, small things can turn into large things. Usually those so-called small matters contain agreements on technical issues or clear burden sharing between the team members. The members of the COSAC have declared their intention to work in accordance with the rules of procedures. The most valuable part of this it is the article that allows the Presidency Parliament to host the COSA conferences. The Presidency gives, the, gives all the national parliaments the opportunity to set the agenda for parliamentary debates. And thirdly, let's think about the bigger picture, or in modern words, the ecosystem. The ecosystem for startups is always influenced by the external factors. Also, the COSAC had to adjust enlargements and changes in the European political culture in mediatization. For example, during the first COSAC conference, there was only one agenda item, and each member state had time to limit of 15 minutes. Today, we can welcome delegates from 28 member states, as well as five candidate countries. We are glad to see also delegations from Norway, Switzerland, Georgia and Iceland. On the one hand, each delegation is, is given less time to participate in the debate. On the other hand, the range of topics is much broader. Doesn't this mirror of challenges of our time? The problems have become more complex than ever and we are constantly racing against time. 
At the same time, the electorate and the media are expecting quick and simple, simple solutions. In conclusion, I would like to stress that although the globalized world forces to us to face many challenges and has become unpredictable, the Cossack has remained. It was and still is an irreplaceable platform that brings together the politicians who work with EU matters. So Cossack has become a social scale-up. Behind this success story is the passion of the parliamentarians who want to meet up and share their thoughts with each other in an open and friendly manner. And dear colleagues, finally, don't forget that you are today in the plenary where one-third of the members of the parliament are voted via internet, not on the pulse station. We are in a state where 96% of the taxpayers declare their incomes to the state via internet. It takes for them two minutes. And you are in the plenary where the Speaker of the Parliament can't use a pencil in his everyday work because every, everything is di digital. So, thank you for your attention. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. President. Dear colleagues, before we proceed, let me extend a kind welcome to those chairpersons who were recently elected into their current position and are attending the Cossack chairpersons meeting for their first time. Therefore, I welcome Ms. Soyara Rodriguez, Chair of the Joint Committee of the European Union in the Spanish Cortes and Ms. Sabine Tia, the President of the European Affairs Committee of the French National Assembly. Now, I would like to briefly inform you on some practical issues. Interpretation services are available in English, French, German, Italy, Polish and Estonian. Please follow the instructions on your table. There you will see also how to access the Wi-Fi. For your information, this conference is being streamed live in the web page of our parliamentary dimension. You are most welcome to share your ideas on the topics of this meeting on Twitter. When requesting for the floor, please use the touch screen in front of you. Please follow the instructions on your table. To register for the debate, please press the head button once on the conference unit. To withdraw your request for the floor from the list, press the head button again. I will, I will address you when it is your turn to take the floor, you are not required to press any button. Microphone will open and close automatically. Your conference unit will show the remaining time for your speech. All the relevant documents are available on the documents table just outside this hall. Please note that due to heritage protection requirements, food and drinks are not allowed in the meeting room. Water and coffee are served outside the plenary room during the whole conference. And finally, if you have any further questions 
our staff is more than happy to assist you. Dear colleagues, let us proceed the adoption of the agenda for the COSAC meeting. A draft program of our meeting has been already distributed to you. Let me briefly recap the agenda. On the agenda, we have two topics. First, the priorities of the Estonian Presidency of the Council of the European Union. Second session is from start-ups to scale-ups, EU's a new potential. Let me now open the floor for short comments. If there are no comments, then the agenda for this COSAC chairperson's meeting is approved. Let us now move to the next agenda item, which is the procedural matters. Sorry. Uh, Ms. Gabriella Kretu. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I'd like to, to make some general comments. Uh, usually I am more revolutionary, but this time I choose stepping back and thinking deep uh, for a minute to our old good habits. And I'd like to kindly request future presidencies and you as well uh, to start again, including in the registration form, political group every participant belongs to, and of course saving time for political group meetings, uh, meeting sister parties, fellows, it is very important for us, and they were uh, long ago uh, perhaps the most useful genuine debates uh, in our meeting. Uh, and of course not knowing which party won uh, of the speakers belong to prevents us good understanding and creates misunderstandings. Uh, a far-right position has different meaning if uh, adopted by a small opposition party uh, or by the leader of a mainstream uh, government party in a country. Uh, secondly, it's the agenda. Uh, I remind you our last conference in Malta. Having 42 minutes uh, available and 41 members uh, willing to express their views and uh, practically succeeding in saying almost nothing. And it is very, very frustrating. Uh, I, I hope you, you would agree. And uh, because during one or two days we try to debate everything. We have to choose if we organize a huge debate, really debate, debating on one or two topics, or try to run and run in a kind of race, uh, but without actually explaining our position, our differences, and trying to coordinate really among us. And thirdly, I like you very much to start again sending written position if our chambers adopted before on one of our topics uh, a position. We have to send this position and to be available for all participants because otherwise uh, everything is exceptionally bureaucratic. Speaking one minute and saying something or nothing, and uh, after uh, without uh, really concluding on, uh, on the topic. Uh, this, were, this was my proposal for today. Thank you. Thank you for your proposals. We shall consider this. Let us now move to the next agenda item, which is the procedural matters. Dear colleagues, 
I am glad to inform you on the results of the presidential troika of Posak, letters received by the presidency and other procedural issues. First, draft agenda of the 58th COSAC plenary meeting. The plenary meeting of the COSAC will take place in Saku Suurhail, Tallinn, on 26 to 28 November. We have included five topics on the agenda of the COSAC plenary meeting. The future of the EU, the role of national parliaments, digital single market, security and migration. On migration, we intend to focus on its external dimension on digital single market, we will focus on digital services. On the role of national parliaments, we want to discuss ways to make EU affairs debate in national parliaments more open and inclusive. On the future of the EU, the President of the Republic of Estonia Kersti Kaljulait has agreed to address the meeting as the keynote speaker, while the Commissioner for the Security Union, Julian King, will launch the discussion on security issues. Other keynote speakers of the COSAC plenary are the Vice President of the European Commission, Hans Timmermans, Commissioner for the Digital Agenda, Andrew Zanzip, and Commissioner for Migration, Home Affairs and Citizenship, Dimitris Avramopoulos. Next, I would like to briefly outline the 28th biannual report of COSAC, which will base on the information obtained from the questionnaire, the report will be divided into three chapters. Chapter one will address the future of the European Union and will aim to obtain information from parliaments, chambers on their methods of securitizing EU legislation and on their positions regarding specific EU reports. Chapter 2 seeks to analyze citizens' involvement in the decision-making process and discussions relating to EU policy, improving the interaction between civil society and the public sector goes to the very heart of democracy and is therefore vital to the work of national parliaments. This chapter will aim to establish best practices in making the work of parliaments, chambers more transparent. Finally, Chapter 3 will focus on the digital single market with a special emphasis on the digitalization of parliamentary procedures. The questionnaire will be sent to delegations on 27 July and replies will be expected by 18 September. Third, letters received by the Presidency. We have received letters from Parliament Georgia, Parliament Iceland, Parliament of Norway and Parliament of Switzerland regarding participation at COSAC meetings. I am glad to welcome them all here. Next. We have received a letter from chairpersons of the European Union Affairs Committee of 
Visegrad group with a request to include additional item related to the financing of north-south axis. Infrastructure project projects from the EU funds not allocated on a national basis within the framework of the multi-annual multi multi financial framework into the agenda of the POSAC plenary meeting. Next, we have received a letter from chairperson of the European Union Affairs Committee of Georgian Parliament with a request to include additional topic concerning the achievements and future of the Eastern Partnership into the agenda of the COSAC plenary meeting. Fourth, appointment, appointment of the permanent member of the COSAC Secretariat for 2018 to 2019. Dear colleagues, on the 31st of December 2017, the second term of the office of the permanent member of the COSAC Secretariat, Ms. Kristina Prida, will expire. The rules of procedural of the COSAC provide for the COSAC chairpersons to appointment the permanent member of the COSAC Secretariat on the proposal of the presidential troika. Therefore, we need to start with the election procedure in this summer in order to be ready to appoint new permanent member of the COSAC Secretariat at the meeting of the COSAC chairpersons during the COSAC plenary in November. Yesterday, Presidential Reika discussed this issue and decided that I will send out letters to all national parliaments inviting them to nominate candidates for the post by September 29. All the necessary information of the process will be described in this letter. I also want to very briefly update you on the state of play concerning the co-financing of the permanent member of the COSAC Secretariat and related office costs for 2018 to 2019. Letters of intent concerning the co-financing have been received from 39 chambers of 26 national parliaments. Reminders will be sent out after the COSAC chairpersons meeting. Dear colleagues, I am opening the discussion of the procedural issues. Mr. Leiden. Just in relation to the COSAC meeting here in um, the autumn, surely there should be an update on the Brexit discussions at that stage. Brexit is the most important, the most significant issue facing the European Union since its inception. And it is very important that members of COSAC, members of the different countries would have an opportunity of getting an update from Mr. Bernier uh, here in Estonia uh, later in the year because we in Ireland particularly are affected by the Brexit situation with our, our trade with the United Kingdom, our relationship with the United Kingdom, our location with the United Kingdom. So I feel that you should consider to include Brexit in uh, one item for a report from the negotiators at that stage. Thank you. Thank you for your proposal. We shall process and address this. Ms. Isabel Klock. Mr. Chairman, 
I would like to refer to the letter sent by the Visegrad group countries. The letter was addressed to you, Mr. Chairperson, and it referred to financing infrastructure projects on the north-south axis, such as via Carpathia Rail Baltic Express or the Canal Oder Danube. We would like to include in the agenda of the November meeting in Cossack uh, an item uh, regarding the financing of the infrastructure uh, projects from the EU resources within the framework of multi-annual financial framework. Until now, the, uh, Europe has been investing mostly in west-east axis. That's why I believe that we should also invest in the north-south axis. We have raised this issue at a meeting on the 6th of July. It was the uh, summit of Three Seas Initiative. The Central and Eastern Europe is a region that has been developing very dynamically and it has a lot of potential. Still, we are lagging behind uh, Western Europe. That's why I believe that it's very important to strive to improve uh, the uh, economic situation of that region. Funds coming from the uh, cohesion fund indeed helped our region to improve standards of living of our citizens. Still, there is a gap between the countries of Western Europe and Eastern Europe. And I believe that the most uh, crucial issue is for development of our region is the transport network. That's why we would like to, we would welcome investments in roads in our region. These investments can be financed from the cohesion policy, but also from the Connecting Europe facility. However, there are certain weaknesses in that program, and that's why we would like to address it during the COSAC meeting. I believe that the European Commission should abandon the rule that allows it to devote only 10% of funds from the national envelope to building roads. What also makes it difficult to finance building of roads from that instrument is the amount of uh, uh, financing, namely uh, only 10% of the entire value of the project can be granted by the European Commission. And these are serious obstacles to the development of the transport network, both in terms of roads, railways, and inland waterways. The European Commission is planning to review the comprehensive network TNT for the years 2023-2025. I welcome it, but I actually I believe that this review should be carried out earlier so that it can take into account our suggestions as countries who have vested interest in uh, that transport network. Uh, we hope that you will take our opinion into account and you will put uh, on the agenda of Kozak this particular issue in November. Thank you. Thank you. I agree this is very important issue. I assure you, as a presidency, we have to and we will deal with this issue as well. Mr. Yaroslav Obrensky. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, support uh, Irish and Romanian uh, friends. In my opinion, every meeting of COSAC we discuss about the strength of the role of national parliaments. And um, it means, in my opinion, we can cancel the, the point of agenda bringing Europe closer to its citizen because uh, we can, in practice, we can uh, send, collect and send uh, this uh, best practice in the written uh, form. And in this place, we can focus on and really discussion about, for example, the external dimension of migration or about the problem of uh, Brexit. Because one hour means that we only pretend that we discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you for your remark. We shall discuss it with uh, Troika.
Mr. Günther Griffom. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to uh, agree to what Ms. Credo said in one issue. If we put too many items on the agenda, we will have no time left to intensively deal with those issues that the Troika actually put on the agenda. And of course, financial debates might be important. The multi-annual financial framework has been discussed in other places lots of times, and we will have it on other agendas in the future as well. So I'd really like to caution that we focus on those issues that are important, like digital agenda that are put on the agenda by the Estonian presidency, that we take the time to really discuss these issues in depth, because if we now expand the agenda, uh, this will help no one, because then we will have uh, 41 minutes of talking time with 42 people who would like to speak, and this is something I do not want to have, so a clear no, and I would not like to see the issue of the multi-annual financial framework on the issue. However, Brexit is a, a thing in development, and this has to be accompanied by the parliamentary dimension, and this also has to be accompanied by the COSEC, so I clearly support the Irish intervention. Thank you for your proposal and uh, your remarks. We. Uh, trying to, to uh, uh, take into account these remarks. Colleagues, thank you. Now let's move on to the next session. I would like to kindly invite Mr. Yuri Ratas, Prime Minister of the Republic of Estonia, to introduce us on the priorities on the Estonian presidency of the Council of the European Union. Colleagues, please use the touch screen to sign up to the, for the debate. Prime Minister Ratas, the floor is yours. Honorable members of the National Parliament, Chairman of the European Union Affairs Committee, Thomas Witzut, dear colleagues from Rigigogo and EU institutions. First of all, let me thank the European Parliament and first Vice President, Madam McNitz for a very warm welcome last week in Strasbourg. Once more, thank you. I am glad to have this opportunity today to discuss with you the priorities of the Estonian Presidency of the Council of the European Union. I would like to start a positive note. During recent months, I have visited my colleagues in European capitals to listen and to learn about their expectations for the next six months. Everywhere I went, there was a strong belief that things are moving in a better direction. These open and forward-looking encounters have reassured me that Europe is stronger than it sometimes appears. There is willingness and desire to stick and to work together. My colleagues in the European institutions believe the same. We have to keep this spirit during our presidency and beyond. The motto of our presidency is unity through balance. Our role is to find a balance between the different views, traditions and interests in Europe today to achieve the best possible outcome for our, for European citizens. This is a role we take on with a sense of responsibility 
but also with enthusiasm and hope. Estonia is focusing on four main priorities. The first one is an open and innovative European economy. The second is the safe and secure Europe. The third is a digital Europe and, of course, the free movement of data. And the fourth one is an inclusive and sustainable Europe. It will not come as a surprise that one of Estonia's priorities is a digital Europe. We believe that Europe is ready for a common, modern, accessible and secure electronic environment where the risks are managed and benefits are obvious. We will focus on the increased use of e-solutions and the free movement of data as well as the development of cross-border e-services and e-commerce. Regarding open and innovative economy, a strong single market is a key driver of economic welfare. To use the full potential of the single market, one of our greatest achievements, we must create a simple and predictable business environment and a stable banking sector. We need to boost the cross-border provision of services, advance trade negotiations and take a step towards cleaner energy. Without doubt, safe and secure Europe is what the citizens expect most from the EU. We can only keep Europe safe if we act together in the spirit of solidarity and responsibility. Estonia is highly committed to carry on with the asylum system reform. We are also following closely the developments in Italy. We must be united in our response and find a balance between those countries on the front lines and others. Closing the central Mediterranean road and assisting Libya is an immediate concern. The Estonian government has decided to allocate 1 million euros on the EU Africa Trust Fund, and I encourage all member states to increase their contributions. Protection of the external borders also remains at the top of our agenda. Creation of databases that talk to each other and IT solutions that make the Schengen area and the EU safer in the way forward. In the fight against terrorism and organized crime, we must make the financing of terrorism more difficult and enhance cross-border police and security services cooperation. It is now a common understanding that Europe needs to take more responsibility for its own defence and security. While NATO will remain a cornerstone of transatlantic security, we welcome eff efforts to enhance defence cooperation and to improve Europe's defence capabilities. An ambitious Eastern partnership focusing on a prosperous and stable neighbourhood is also the interest of the entire EU. Last, but by no means least, an inclusive and sustainable Europe is an essential goal for maintaining the quality of life for all European citizens. Over the next six months, we will focus on ways in which the EU can offer equal opportunities 
for people who wish to live and work in the EU on developing technologies to bring people with disabilities closer to society and to balance work and family life. We believe that the balance between economic growth and environmental protection is very important. The circle economy offers us an opportunity to reinvent the wheel and to make our economy more sustainable and competitive. Today's actions and tomorrow's future are closely interlinked with climate change. Europe must fulfill our commitment to the Paris Agreement and push ahead with the work on the main standards of the EU energy and climate policy. Of course, the year 2017 will also be about Brexit negotiations. Estonia is at the service of the Member States and the European Institution Commission, while working closely with the European Parliament, and yet Brexit should not limit our horizons. The Union must move forward in numerous other areas to continue providing new benefits for our citizens and delivering results. In Bratislava, in Malta, in Rome, we had a frank and honest discussions about where we stand and what we need to do to address the most pressing concerns of our citizens. There is a lot that we can achieve together in these six months. Of course, we cannot fix everything the next 184 days. But we are determined to do our best in a very Estonian way. Promising less, but doing our best to deliver more. I very much look forward to working with all the Member States. I wish you very fruitful Kosak today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Ratas, for the overview of the priorities. Colleagues, now we may move on to the panel discussion. There are a lot of you signed up for the debate. Please hold your individual remarks within two minutes. The time will be displayed on the screen. Green. Mr. Terileiden. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, first of all, Prime Minister, uh, thank you for the hospitality which you have extended to us as delegates here in Tallinn and beautiful Estonia. Um, I think your presidency has been, is been, and is very successful. You are showing the strength of the great developments here in Estonia in relation to data and free movement of data, and that was very, very important, and I commend you in that particular regard. I'd like to also say I'm delighted that uh, Ms. Mary McGuinness is here, MAP, first Vice President of the European Union, with special responsibility for COSAC, and I'm also particularly delighted that we have a British delegation here in Baroness Faulkner and Christopher Johnson and Paul Downing, all slides to your colleagues from the United Kingdom here because I also like to remind people that the European, United Kingdom are full members of the European Union until Brexit, until the leave. So in the meantime, we work together and develop our, continue to develop our relationships before or after Brexit, because it is, it is the most important issue. And I keep reminding people that we in Ireland are the most affected of the 27 countries outside of the United Kingdom. So, I just want to say that, that it's very important for us here, 
I'm delighted to be here in uh, Estonia and in Tallinn, and I was delighted to have your, um, your ambassador last week explaining your priorities, and we outlined the situation there. So, well done. Thank you again. Gorma Yamakov. Thank you. Mr. Vanino Kitti. Mr. Prime Minister, I would like to thank you very much because I, I share your assessment that Europe has, Europe is moving again. Things are getting better, although the challenge is not over. As Mrs. Merkel said, there is more awareness on the fact that Europeans have to build their future without letting others do that. And security, development, growth, defense, and climate. And I also share your priorities on the, uh, during the Estonian presidency. I will tell you half jokingly that if we were in the Italian parliament and if I had to cast a vote, I would pass, uh, I would vote for the confidence in your government. And thank you very much also for the uh, focus uh, that you have on the Mediterranean and the issue of migrants in Italy, because these issues are European issues. Relations with Russia are European issues. The Mediterranean and migrants is a European issue. Uh, we have to overcome our differences between North and South, otherwise we, we're going nowhere. And I would like to give you some information. In 2017, the migrants reached in Italy were 85,000 in July. So 18% more than last year. And the Balkan corridor after the agreement with Turkey was closed. And in 2016, the Balkan route has a traffic of uh, minus 72%. Western Balkans uh, minus 84% plus 18% in the Mediterranean. In 2015, uh, the uh, re a resettlement of refugees was decided, involving 160,000 people from Italy and Greece, and of these, only 20,000 were resettled, of which 6,000 from Italy. Now, to conclude, we need to have a common effort and common resources. Otherwise, we are not going to stabilize Libya. We're not going to establish hotspots, and we're not going to. We will not govern the phenomenon of migration. Thank you very much for your efforts. Edgar Mayer. Thank you, Herr Thank you, Chair, for the hospitality. Uh, I know I have to keep my praise short because I won't have any time left to speak. But I'd like to uh, thank the Prime Minister for outlining the priorities for the presidency. It's the first time for Estonia to hold the presidency and congratulations on that. We wish you luck. It is a very responsible uh, task, but I know that you take it on with a lot of commitment and a lot of competence. Austria will hold the presidency in one year from now. So together we're uh, in the Troika with Bulgaria and Estonia and we're looking forward to this cooperation. So the Estonian program is also a Bulgarian and an Austrian program. Well, you can only really edge out uh, the issues in the brief time we have available. Economy is important, the labor market, jobs, at the same time economy must be sustainable. We must deal with social issues, we must deal with environmental issues. It is regrettable that the United States uh, renounced the Paris, uh, Paris Climate Agreement and uh, still hope that they will rethink their position. Terrorism is a decisive issue for all of us and uh, without limiting the basic, the fundamental freedoms. Uh, migration was mentioned by our Italian friends. We definitely need to come up with support. We definitely need to have a joint approach by the EU member states and also uh, everything needs to be distributed throughout Europe in a just and fair way. A lot has been said on Brexit. A lot of work is ahead of us, there is no doubt. And in this joint presidency, we will try to implement it uh, during this presidency of the Bulgarian and the Austrian presidency. Digital agenda, well, uh, it is high time that we take this challenge on, that we put it on the agenda, and digital Estonia can really serve as an example and show great success. Once again, lots of success, best of luck for the months of the Estonian presidency. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Ms. Regina Bastos. Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister, a first word to congratulate Estonia for its first presidency of the Council of the EU and to express my wishes of successful presidency. The priorities of the Estonian presidency are shared by Portugal. The focus on the digital economy doesn't put aside the development of an open, secure, inclusive and sustainable Europe. It's necessary to develop an energy market with special emphasis in the electricity market, which is a crucial factor for the competitiveness of the economies of some member states, mainly Portugal. It's also fundamental to look at the banking sector. It's vital to complete economic and monetary union through the concretization of the third pillar, the European Insurance Deposit Scheme, and make sure that a true and complete banking union is on place as soon as possible. We totally support with the proposal of the European Commission in its reflection paper on the future of economic and monetary union regarding the creation of monetar European monetary fund. We also share the importance of promoting tax uh, transparency through prevention and fighting the tax illusion and evasion which was subject of a green card initiative from the Portuguese Parliament. We'll, uh, we'll live in a challenge Europe, the Brexit, the refugees, the climate changes, an inclusive and fair labour market, the security and defence. These are just a few of the challenges that not only this presidency, but also all of us as politicians and also the European citizens must face. Thank you very much. Thank you. Baroness Kishwe Faulkner. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Can I start by congratulating Estonia on having taken over the presidency at this point. We were commenting with other delegates last night that it should have been the United Kingdom, and we very much appreciate your taking it up as at short notice when the electors of the United Kingdom decided that we had to go in a different direction. Can I also, Mr. President, congratulate you on the centenary of your independence next year, and I hope that that will go swimmingly and according to plan. We will share, the people of the United Kingdom will share Estonia's delight in that occasion. I should explain that I'm here replacing Lord Boswell, who is, as you know, very familiar to all of the delegations here. He's currently unwell, and I'm sure all present will join me in wishing him a very speedy recovery. I will try to replace him to the best of my abilities. Much has been said about Brexit, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, and I just wanted to reassure Mr. Terry Layden, our, our Irish counterpart here, that the United Kingdom Parliament and the House of Lords in particular has published a large number of reports scrutinizing our government, advocating a course of action and informing the public regarding the position of the United Kingdom to Brexit. We produced a detailed report on Anglo-Irish relations in December and we'd be delighted to send him a copy and indeed anyone else who would like to see that. Coming to the theme of the conference, Mr. President, this is more than timely. It is increasingly important that Europe's competitiveness be addressed and I'm delighted to see that Estonia has taken up the challenge and will run with it. I look forward to contributing later in that discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words. Ms. Jona Solveig Elinardotti. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, I would like to thank the Estonian Presidency for the invitation to attend this meeting and to congratulate you on having uh, taken over the Presidency. We wish you all the best. It is of great value for Iceland to be able to follow developments and priorities of our partners in the European Union in this way. And I must say that the tone struck in the priorities of the Estonian Presidency the tone European unity through balance, where nobody feels rejected, a steadfast but at the same time smart and flexible union which serves its peoples and works at improving and elevating the standard of living for European citizens, 
is a tone that we in Iceland relate to very strongly and that we wish to contribute to through our participation in the European integration process. And we particularly welcome the strong focus of the presidency and uh, which it places on openness, innovation and simplicity in the regulatory environment that we are bound to develop together for our businesses. If any international organization should be able to be innovative and find innovative solutions to difficult challenges, it would be and it needs to be the European Union. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Philippe Mau. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Mon tour uh, en français, je voudrais vous remercier évidemment pour la qualité de votre accueil. Et je vais m'attacher à parler du. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you uh, for the warm welcome we have received here in Estonia. When it comes uh, to the digital market in Europe, then uh, Estonia truly is an example for all of us. Uh, but one of the questions uh, we should tackle is accessibility. It is important uh, to educate people, to make people more aware of uh, this area. And um, when we talk about security, you uh, mentioned uh, NATO in your speech, uh, but we should also speak about the uh, civilian dimension. And the third topic that is also very important is um, the protection of uh, privacy. In the Belgian Senate, um, we have dealt a lot with um, health issues and the protection of uh, privacy is of utmost importance in this context. As uh, you uh, also mentioned uh, digital issues uh, related to the work of uh, national parliaments. Uh, um, then here um, it also has to do with the immunity of um, members of the parliaments. Uh, in, uh, even in Europe we have countries uh, who do not uh, uh, grant the freedom of speech um, to politicians and um, the immunity of uh, parliamentarians is, uh, is very important. Now, uh, going forth from what the previous speakers mentioned and uh, everything that has to do with European projects, uh, then the posting of workers directive is, uh, is very important, uh, especially the dialogue uh, that uh, precedes uh, the adoption of the directive, I think this is the only way that will lead us to success. Because our citizens find that the directive in its current form uh, does uh, not uh, help the European idea to be accomplished. Thank you. Mr. R Richard Herchik. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Chairman, dear Mr. Prime Minister, my dear colleagues. I welcome the priorities of the Estonian Presidency and express my support for its implementation. I also congratulate Estonia for creating a comprehensive presidential program in a really very short time. This program is ambitious and addresses the most actual challenges ahead of us. Dear Mr. Chairman, I would like to mention just one item, uh, very briefly of course, on the Brexit. As we saw, the withdrawal negotiations have already started and hopefully during the next six months some key issues will be agreed upon. First dossier to be addressed is the rights of citizens and in, in this respect we need to achieve a fair deal for both parties at the early stage of the negotiations. I would also mention this very important issue that it is clear that the withdrawal of the United Kingdom creates a gap of around 10 billion euro in the EU budget per year, 10 million euro. The EU member states need to decide whether to adjust uh, to this shortfall by increasing national contributions, cutting spending, or a combination of the two. In addition, Mr. Chairman, Brexit will have a direct effect on the next multi-annual financial framework to be started in, as we know, 2021. 
the proposal regarding the next MFF most probably will be issued by the European Commission next year. Finally, Mr. Chairman, a remark on the European reform process. I am really convinced that the current European Union does not need any major integration steps, but a consolidation of the achievements, including the free movement of workers, the strengthened role of the national parliament. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Fabienne Keller. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Merci, Monsieur le Premier Ministre. Monsieur le Président, pour votre accueil. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Prime Minister. You uh, have uh, provided us with uh, sunshine for today's meeting. Thank you for that. On my behalf, I would uh, like to congratulate you on uh, the priorities you have chosen for your presidency. And first of all, I would like to speak about uh, Brexit. As was said by uh, Mr. Leiden previously, uh, the risks are high, especially for Ireland. And uh, we should uh, try to support Ireland as much as possible. Now, the unity between the t remaining 27 member states is also very important. I would also like to mention the migration crisis. It has already been said that the situation in uh, Italy is uh, increasingly serious and um, the migration issue is one of your priorities during your presidency as well. And I would like to uh, um, advise you to move even further uh, to uh, use more of the potential that Frontex has and to put extra financing into Frontex. Now, when we talk about the financial issues, our uh, citizens are shocked seeing uh, how uh, in uh, big uh, corporations um, the numbers of staff is being cut. But uh, maybe in the economy overall, we should um, try to influence uh, the economy through the interest rates. And further, we should also discuss uh, climate policy, digital policy. Um, this is all very important, but colleagues have al already uh, mentioned it, and I would just like you to wish you all the best for your presidency. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Günther Kriftbaum. Thank you, Chairman. Of course, I would like to join in the congratulations, congratulations to you on the Council Presidency, to the agenda setting, and Prime Minister Ratas, congratulations to you as well, because it was your birthday recently. And uh, I would like to convey our very best wishes to you. So, as I said, it's an excellent agenda. Many of my colleagues have already mentioned this, a safe and secure Europe and uh, economic growth as well. I think if political challenges shift, then this has to be reflected by the budget. We have to have the necessary funding. So we cannot just look the other way, uh, considering what is happening in Italy right now. In other words, the weighting within the budget uh, may have to shift, also including the multi-annual financial framework. For instance, by setting up refugee infrastructures. Because there are two things we can do, basically. Uh, either helping solve the problems in Africa, or the problems will come to us, and we'll have to see what is cheaper in the end. One remark concerning the digital agenda. I would be interested in hearing how things work in Estonia. Estonia is the spearhead in Europe when it comes to digitize, digitalization. But my question would be, what happens to the data? Who owns the data? Do the data belong to those who provide the data, those who use the data, those who collect the data? For instance, if the person who provides the data 
uh, dies at some point? What happens? Uh, are the data inherited? So it would be very interesting to hear how Estonia handles these matters, because those are certainly future topics for us in the European Union. And finally, let me thank you for your commitment during the presidency. Thank you. Mr. Bojan Kekic. Thank you for the floor. First of all, I want to thank colleagues from Estonia for the warm welcome and good organization of these COSAC meetings. When I read the priorities of the Estonian Presidency of the Council of the European Union, I was satisfied with the choices and the emphasis uh, the innovative and digital supported Europe, sustainable Europe, as a caretaker of, for our environment, uh, the Europe of equal opportunities for every citizen without discrimination is the way for our future. But as my uh, presenters say, there are some important topics that are not addressed as, for example, Brexit. Uh, but no one of these goals can be enforced in the form that we want if we do not make Europe safer from international terrorism, if we are not able to protect our borders and hands of our civilizations. We also should not leave some of the European Union countries facing this, this challenge alone. In the future months, the migrant flow will probably increase because of a good weather condition, so we must take concrete action also in third countries to tackle this issue. Uh, the migrant crisis must be tackled in the countries where it's being created. Each European country should assume responsibility for a specific country in North Africa, because I think uh, that this forum of country-specific assistance would be the best solution to the migrant crisis. While at the same time establishing a stronger security system at the sea and the land. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Ms. Merit McInnes. Thank you, Chair, and my thanks to the Prime Minister for your um, strong commitment in the Presidency and also your remarks here. We in the European Parliament had the privilege of a debate with you last week, and I think it went really well, um, and I hope you enjoyed uh, the engagement with members, many diverse uh, comments made in the debate. I have to say I feel somewhat of the old technology in the room because I'm using a pen, and I know that your unique selling point, if you like, is your focus on the digital uh, agenda. And really, I think that's something that we should use every opportunity to learn from Estonia. So well done on that and also on the sharing of knowledge. The issue of digital security, though, is something that citizens worry about, about data sharing. So we look forward to hearing more in relation to that in the coming months. Um, and on the question of migration, I think tackling the root causes is something that Europe really wants to take on board because immediate solutions are one thing, but we have to address the reasons why people leave their home countries and come to Europe. So I look forward to that debate. In relation to Brexit, the European Parliament is obviously deeply engaged in the uh, discussions and the negotiations, and I note the comments here of colleagues from national parliaments. In a way, we should use Brexit as an opportunity to learn about how Europe works, and therefore I welcome your opening statement that Europe is moving in a better direction, and that while Brexit is a serious issue, it is not the only issue that Europe is engaged with. Um, I think my last remark will be this. You summarized that perhaps you will promise less to do your best, but to deliver more. And in a way, I think that that's something that Europe perhaps should look to doing. That if we can deliver more, then I think we will have the support of citizens. So you've given us uh, food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Tamar Kolardaba. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate Estonia on the uh, presidency, on organizing very well this forum, and uh, also thanking Estonia for this wonderful hospitality. 
Uh, we, as Georgian delegation, are happy to be present at the COSAC meeting, and we are thankful to all of you, to national parliaments, for extending this opportunity to us once again. The year of 2017 is a very special one. It's a special one for Estonia. As I uh, said, it is the, uh, in the responsible position of uh, presidency of the Council, but also for Georgia it's a special year because this year we celebrate re-establishment of Georgia's uh, diplomatic ties with many of your countries, in fact. Uh, in addition to that, it is also a special one because we're looking forward to the Eastern Partnership Summit, which is to take place during the Estonian presidency. And I'm very happy that the uh, ambitious Eastern Partnership was something that was mentioned along with the priorities that uh, were outlined by the Prime Minister. Uh, we, uh, of course, highly value the support that Georgia has had for many years from all of you, uh, from all these uh, countries, from the European Union in particular, um, for our European choice and European aspirations. The Eastern Partnership Summit will be yet another opportunity for um, our country to, uh, and for actually for the entire world, to get a very important signal and a message that Europe remains open to the European countries in line with the Treaty of the European Union, which states that as long as criteria are met, the countries should have a perspective. And this is what we would very much like to see in the Declaration, although with all due respect to the problems, challenges that the EU is currently facing. But uh, EU is in good hands, I, I'm sure, and the, uh, these challenges will be overcome. And it is very important to keep this ambition going. And it is very important to keep this ambition going also for the countries such as Georgia, where the uh, path to the European Union actually is what, uh, what accelerates democratic reforms and what makes Georgia truly European institutional democracy. So thank you very much once again. All the, um, you know, I wish you success in the next six months and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Václav Hampel. <coughs> Thank you, Chair, for, for the floor. I also want to join those who thank uh, you for the hospitality, hospitality here. Uh, I personally think that the priorities of the Estonian presidency are very well chosen. Uh, we have yet to discuss it in, in the Czech Senate next, next week, but I'm sure uh, there will be clear support for, for the priorities. I have, I have one particular question. Uh, one process that is scheduled to be happening during the uh, Estonian presidency is the debate on the future shape uh, of the EU based on the White Paper and on the Rome Declaration. Uh, and I think uh, that it is very critical, very essential that this debate is transparent and, it, and that it includes citizens or communication with citizens. Uh, what I'm afraid uh, would be not a very good uh, result uh, would be if we learn what is the result of the discussion two weeks before the European Council in, in December. So we need to have a you know, uh, continuous transparent process. And I was just wondering uh, whether we have specific plans how to, how to organize such a debate. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nenat Chanak. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear friends, allow me to thank you on behalf of the European Integration Committee of the National Assembly for inviting the committee chairperson and to extend my pleasure for participating in this conference for the first time in the capacity of the committee chairperson. I believe that we will maintain uh, the continuity of our good relations mutual cooperation and in providing support to Serbia on its path towards the Europe, EU uh, membership. The enlargement policy was the foundation for the development of the EU as we know it today and one of the most successful EU policies. Unfortunately, this policy has been hindered lately. Uh, for the enlargement uh, countries, including Serbia, it is essential to preserve the stability of their path towards the EU. The support for the reforms in the Western Balkan countries is of great importance and a clear perspective of EU membership 
is a key factor of stability in the region. During the Estonian presidency, we expect the positive attitude towards the enlargement process to be continued. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Paolo Tancredi. Thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you very much, Prime Minister, for the important things you said, for the priorities which I share, for your optimism on the effectiveness of European policies, and Europe is starting to grow again, and so I believe we have to bring to success the uh, Pro, the, the processes we started, like the banking unit, union, the, the own budget and the own resources of the European Union, and protection of deposits, and, and growth policies. I would also like to thank the Prime Ministers for focusing on uh, security and migration, especially in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, there is no doubt that during the last uh, council, during the latest council, the, there were uh, important uh, steps forward made with respect to the aware to awareness with respect to this problem. But there is no doubt that very little is being done, and we, I believe, we cannot wait any more for a strong authoritative action of the European Union uh, today, especially in Italy. We have improved our system of uh, my, our migrant identification system, which was uh, justly criticized in the past, which wasn't working in the past. And I believe that uh, that system is now very close to perfection. But there is no doubt that uh, we have to uh, face this problem. The problem has to be dealt with at source, where migration uh, emerges when where, where migrants come from and today we are all aware that within Libya there is a migration industry which makes money and speculates on uh, people on human beings and they violate horribly violate uh, human rights on a daily basis with significant human losses clearly Europe has to face this problem uh, in a unitary way in terms of diplomacy, in terms of resources, but also in military terms. The money that was allocated is less than a tenth than Europe earmarked for the agreement with Turkey. Thank you. Mr. Malik Osmani. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Thank you very much for your kind hospitality also yesterday evening. Uh, and also I would like, on behalf of the Dutch Parliament, congratulate you with your first presidency of the Council of the European Union. It's, uh, I know for sure, it's a very special moment uh, for you, and it's not only for you, but it's for all us together to be here. Uh, I have just one simple question uh, to Mr. Ratas. You have an ambition ag agenda, and as a Dutchman, I like it very much. But your motto is unity through balance. And my concrete question is, what's your typical concrete actions to bring controversial issues a step further? For example, migration. What's the typical Estonian way to do that? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Gabriela Kretu. Thank you very much, Chair. Dear colleagues, we do appreciate Estonia for choosing a very 21st century priorities, digital economy. But thank, uh, thanking also our host for uh, receiving us so kindly, I'd like to stress only one idea. I'm sure many of you are aware of. Nobody used to live in a market, digital or not. Citizens live in a society. And we have to act in other two directions uh, simultaneously in order to allow everybody benefiting and to avoid negative effects of the current technological revolution. That means good education for everybody, enable, enabling every citizen to be really a part of the new economy and society, 
we cannot say that it is more a kind of national issue. We don't need coordination and support without the danger of creating new gaps. Uh, a kind of ethical gap, uh, not being prepared actually for current challenges, and a social gap between those including in the new economy and those totally excluded. And secondly, we need new criteria of distribution for the results, or at least a new shorter labor time to avoid uh, unemployment, to allow everybody in the future uh, to have access to a living income and to be integrated in economy. In short time, we need a strong a European pillar of social rights. We need, uh, I'd like to remind you uh, that technological progress, it doesn't mean in a compulsory way social progress. The former industrial revolution destroyed the environment uh, we so hardly try to fix now. We don't want the current one to destroy society, creating a kind of dystopia, a kind of high-tech uh, feudalism and we have to be prepared for this challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Spreza Hader. Thank you. Uh, distinguished Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Ratas, distinguished colleague Witsot, distinguished colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, allow me to wish you a successful presidency of the European Union and success in, um, um, and success in realization of goals and priorities laid down for the next six months. I will repeat the words of the President of the European Commission, Mr. Juncker, that the presidency is in good hands and that history has shown that presidencies of smaller European Union member states are always successful. I come from a small country too. I come from Macedonia, which has been waiting on the doorsteps of the European Union for over uh, 20 years. Estonia knows all too well what it means to be given a chance to become a member of the European Union. I would like to briefly inform you that warmer winds have now begun to blow through Macedonia and have led to a positive step forward to the country's EU integration processes after the two-year political crisis, the resolution of which began with the early parliamentary elections last December. Last week, the government of the Republic of Macedonia adopted the action plan for the implementation of necessary EU reforms, or the so-called Plan 369. It is an interesting title which refers to the project tasks for the next three, six, and nine months. Here, as I must emphasize that the first three months are crucial since Macedonia needs to demonstrate the initial signs of readiness to become a member of the Union. It is to deliver arguments prior to the local elections scheduled this fall so that the European Commission can remove the conditionality of the recommendation to open accession negotiations. The rule of law, systemic reforms, equality among citizens in line with the Ohrid agreement, framework agreement, good neighborly relations, urgent Euro-Atlantic integration, as well as social welfare will be the pillars of our work. Finally, allow me to be optimistic that the political parties, uh, both the ruling party and the opposition, will put the state first and will demonstrate their commitment to the European processes and also will put the country to start the EU membership negotiations. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Christian Tübring Yede. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. First of all, let me thank the Estonian Parliament for the warm welcome and hospitality at, at this meeting. 
I would like to welcome the priorities of the Estonian Presidency. I think many of these priorities are essential to promote a better environment for entrepreneurship and subsequently ensuring that new enterprises can grow. In this context, the significance of the single market cannot be overemphasized. By ensuring common rules and standards and fair competition, the single market is a cornerstone of a business-friendly policy in Europe. The best way to promote innovation is through competitive markets. Further, uh, further the initiatives to strengthen the single market as a tool to promote growth and employment in Europe are welcome. The digital agenda and a more integrated energy market are important to this end. At the same time, the social dimension must be secured through fair and safe working conditions by avoiding social uh, dumping. Uh, at the same time, export of public welfare benefit, creating unfair competition, also needs to be addressed, Mr. Chair. It is the EEA agreement that ensures Norway participation in the single market. When the UK leaves the EU, the country will also leave the EEA. As the country is one of Norway's major trading partners, Norway has of course a keen interest in negotiations about the terms of the Brexit and the future relationship between the EU27 and the UK. Thus, an exit agreement involving single market rules should cover the entire European economic area, not only the EU27. In the event that the EU and the UK agree on transitional agreement, this should also apply to Norway. Mr. Chair, I would like also to add that Europe needs to find a sustainable solution to the migration crisis. In that regard, we have to look for an asylum uh, application that is processed not in Europe, but in the areas where the asylum seekers have their origin. It would, in this regard, uh, be, make sense to bring in the EU and also have a global solution of the refugee crisis. If it is a global issue, a global crisis, a global problem, we need a global solution. It's not Europe's uh, challenge alone to take care of all the immigrants coming from Asia and Africa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Mirokovic. Thank you, Chair, for the excellent organization of this meeting and for yesterday's evening. I would also like to congratulate the Prime Minister of Estonia for the development of, of your country, which is really fascinating how the country has changed in the last 25 years. Now, today you have a strong competitive economy. Um, the priorities of your presidency show that the situation in the European Union has stabilized. We had major challenges. We had the debt crisis, the euro crisis, the um, the, the, the migration crisis and Brexit, and now we can feel that uh, things have changed, uh, that we are moving in the right direction. We have become stronger, and we noticed uh, last weekend in Hamburg at the G20 meeting that the European Union counts. It matters. It is a member of G20. The president of the European Council, Mr. Tusk, was there. Mr. Juncker was there. Four more countries of the European Union are members of G20, and the, the European Union is important, is important, and that's why I'm saying that it is important that we focus on becoming stronger, making our economies stronger, and being competitive. Um, we have to focus on our neighborhood, on the east, on the south. I mean Africa, I mean the Middle East, and I mean Russia, and we have to show that we are able to develop efficient strategies how to make uh, these regions safer and to how to play the dominant role when it comes to these regions, to when I speak about the East and, 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 the, and the South. And my last uh, remark concerns the Western Balkans. We had uh, the colleague from Macedonia and from Serbia. We should focus on that region, that region is a part of Europe, and our goal has to be to have these countries one day in the European Union. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Martin Klus. Dear Mr. President, uh, dear Mr. Prime Minister, dear colleagues, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, once again for your hospitality and uh, including uh, 
ordering perfect weather for us. Uh, <laughs> Slovak delegation appreciate uh, proposed priorities and especially you mentioned the Bratislava process. We believe it is inevitable to honestly speak uh, about uh, where we are and where we are going if it comes to the future of the European Union, uh, especially now when uh, such an important country like uh, United Kingdom is leaving us. We are prepared to be an active part of uh, such a discussion and help to stop activities of uh, extreme groups all around Europe to destroy uh, our integrity and common values. Uh, finally, let me wish you a successful presidency uh, to Estonia and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Ms. Sula Topshu. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Prime Minister and dear colleagues. First of all, we would like to say best for luck for your presidency and thank you for your hospitality. Mr. Prime Minister, as you mentioned in your speech, currently is the, is the EU faces a range of challenges both at the global and, the, and at the EU level. Among the most prominent are the social effects of the economic crisis, the rise in extremist movement, illegal migration, the threat of the terrorism, and Brexit. The EU is expected to show that it is capable of the addressing these challenges. We hope that the EU becomes more inclusive, multicultural, and multi-religious. We also hope that this critical per period will produce the necessary EU reform and ultimately transform the bloc into a more effective entity in the world politics, which is in the turn would be beneficially for Turkey too. As a candidate country facing the same challenges and sharing the same future with the EU, Turkey is ready to contribute to the discussion in the regard. We have particularly seen in this case of migration crisis how positive results are obtained when we cooperate. The threat of terrorism can only be addressed through effective international cooperation and solidarity without any discrimination between terrorist groups. One last, po one last point I want to emphasize. The last EP resolution on Turkey will definitely not make a positive contribution to Turkey-EU relation. Our main expectation is to have relations based on an understanding of mutual respect and equal partnership. Thank you, and I wish you success. Thank you. Mr. Veli Yüksel. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we are faced uh, with um, terrorism in Europe. This is one of the primary challenges to the EU. Uh, we, need to, we need to protect our citizens against uh, the terrorists and their cruel acts, but we also need to protect our democratic values. Our response must be at three levels, protection, intelligence, and prevention. Following the latest attacks by Daesh, uh, linked terrorists in Europe, we must reassess and rethink our approach to fighting the threat from extremist groups. One of the characteristics of the last attacks is that the violence was perpetrated by lone wolves, um, homegrown terrorists. Attackers claimed to be self-radicalized through the internet and social media and carrying out attacks independently uh, of the direct command and control of terrorist organizations. Social media plays a crucial role in this terror wave, and social media and online video became important tools for terrorists. This type of attacks pose a huge uh, challenge uh, to police and uh, security uh, services. Uh, prevention is an important topic when it comes to internet uh, incitement to violence and hate crimes via social media. In our countries, in our democracies, there is the freedom of speech. We have to keep a good balance between this fundamental right and public security. To reach this goal, we have to make laws 
and uh, we have to cooperate on this matter with the EU, uh, with the uh, 27 countries, to convince social media powers like as Facebook, Google, Microsoft and Apple. In Belgium, we are working on that. And my question to the Prime Minister is, which initiatives you will take on this subject as we are in the digital capital of Europe? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Edward Zamit Lewis. Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister, for dedicating a uh, lot of your valuable time to, to listen to us. And we just passed from uh, the experience, the wonderful experience of the presidency, a small country like Estonia with a big responsibility. So best of luck. I uh, would focus on two points uh, with regards to the priorities, a safe and secure Europe. Uh, I'm coming from the southernmost member state, and I believe that we cannot look at a safe and secure Europe in an insular manner. So uh, I believe that there should, should be a stress uh, from a Nordic country to the Mediterranean dimension, the Mediterranean dimension of the European Union. And I believe it's very important, not only from a migration point of view. There are other aspects of security which uh, can help us if, if we cooperate as well with North African countries uh, to solve and it will mean uh, more a safer, a safer Europe and a safer European Union as well. The second point is uh, the digital economy and the, city, the single digital market strategy. Uh, I don't believe uh, this should be only uh, towards a digital Europe. We should look at it as well on eliminating social differences because lack of access to technology is uh, today can be regarded as a social uh, social difference between between amongst our youths. Second is ensuring uh, a level playing field towards our businesses, including the small and micro enterprises, which should have good access to technology as well in order to develop. Thirdly, and I believe that uh, Estonia is the best country, the best well positioned to achieve uh, a single digital market strategy, which means the full completion of the internal market and which means uh, more economic growth in Europe and generation of more jobs. So best, best of luck for, for this important task. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Nikos Tornaritis. Thank you, Chairman, Prime Minister, dear colleagues. Allow me first to thank the Estonian Presidency for the warm hospitality and I wish you every success in achieving the priorities set out in the Presidency's program. First of all, I would like to brief, briefly inform you about the latest developments in the negotiations for the settlement on the Cyprus problem. Unfortunately, the conference on Cyprus at Grand Montana, Switzerland, ended in the early morning of July 7 without any positive results. This was due to the Turkish insistence on continuing the Treaty of Guarantees, on maintaining Turkey's right of intervention and on the permanent presence of Turkish troops on the island and in a European member states. It is clear that these Turkish positions are in stark contrast to the concept of a normal state as the UN Secretary General himself had defined. Dear colleagues, with regard to the priorities of the Presidency, we welcome all four priority sets. We particularly agree with the goals of the Presidency with regard to making the financing of terrorism more difficult, improving cooperation between police and security forces as well as improving the making more efficient 
the information exchange systems of European Union and Union Member States in the process of making our neighbourhood safer and strengthening the streamlining of the common European asylum system is crucial in order to urgently establish a much needed, more coherent, efficient and well managed migration, asylum and borders policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Soraya Rodriguez. Merci. Je vous remercie de votre accueil et je vous, et je vous félicite pour l'élection de votre... Thank you uh, very much uh, for these uh, uh, priorities of the presidency, the goal of which is to achieve a sustainable and com competitive Europe. Uh, right now, it is a very important moment to talk about the future of Europe. We have to try to make it so that uh, uh, this uh, would coincide uh, well with the uh, positions of public opinion, uh, including uh, migration crisis here, uh, trying to find the common answer. These are also very important. Of course, the issue of Brexit is also important uh, at this present moment. Uh, you can count on the support of uh, Spain uh, during your presidency. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jakmadisson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dear colleagues, uh, first of all, you are very welcome here in Estonia. I'm really glad that you have made this long trip from all over Europe. And as you know, like we have a few days summer, and I'm really happy that you bring us the summer and sun. Unfortunately, most of you are leaving today or tomorrow, and then we have to accept that there is coming raining back. But about our presidency, uh, the most of you have mentioned that uh, we have to focus on the Brexit and also on the migration crisis, and you have absolutely right. And what I can guarantee that is Brexit is a very important thing for Estonia and for the next six months. Of course, there are different dimensions, there are different topics, also in all of our like, uh, priorities. There are digital market, as you know, everybody. But also Brexit is one part of the e future of the European Union. And as you know, for the COSAC plenary session in November, the one of the main topics is the future of the EU. And of course, we have to accept that the one main goal of the future is how we're going to have our relations with the UK. As we know, the UK is a very important ally for all the member states of the European Union. And what I'm really glad is that uh, what I've heard that we have a consensus about the migration question that we have to focus to find uh, solutions for the problems in African and the Middle East countries. We all accept that. And as we also know, we have to focus on the problems where we have uh, illegal migration. And everybody has a consensus that we have to have more effective sending back system. Because let's start with the uh, same things where we have uh, agreements and then Let's go for the future. Thank you for wel welcoming and have a nice day in Estonia. Thank you, Mr. Madison. Thank you all for your comments. I pass the floor back to Prime Minister Ratas for remarks on the debate. Honorable members, of the national parliaments, dear colleagues, first of all, I am very thankful for all your positive wishes, statements, and of course your comments. The thoughts and proposals of the national parliaments are always important for the Estonian government. It is never to make predictions in politics, but I am sure that all these topics, what you mentioned, but some of them, for example, migration, for example, Brexit, but also 
digital Europe and the future of the EU will be among maybe the most important topics during our presidency. If I may to say only some remarks or some our opinions about first migration, then uh, I promise you that uh, this question, it isn't only the question for the Italy. It's a question for uh, all EU 28 member states. As I already mentioned, Estonian government has recently decided to support EU Africa Trust Fund. We are also highly committed to carry on with the asylum system reform and taking guidelines from the European Council conclusions agreed in June. We are following the developments in Italy closely and we can assure that Italy is not alone with their concern. Migration was also the key topic of the first informal meeting of the EU ministers of Internal that took place here in Tallinn on the 6th of July. The ministers had fruitful discussions in Tallinn and agreed that the Commission action plan should be Im implemented quickly. Uh, now, the second point, the Brexit, what a lot of you mentioned. I think when it comes to Brexit, then our main goal is to keep these 27 member states united. A lot of uh, my colleagues, if I had these bilateral meetings or here in Estonia, if they asking what is the, what is your main priority or what is the main priority for Estonian presidency, then I said always that to keep this united, to keep uh, European Union more united, more stronger, more safe. And uh, of course, the question is the rights of our citizens and the United Kingdom is the first priority. It is in all our all interest that uh, the divorce process goes as smooth as possible. We expect to continue a close and friendly relationship with the United Kingdom. I also said to Mr. Parnier that we fully support and trust Mr. Parnier uh, as the chief of negotiator. I think he's doing a very hard on the one hand, but on the other hand, very good job. Estonia along the other member states will work closely with all the involved EU institutions. Some uh, words also about the social Europe. I think it is another challenging area during our presidency is finding compromise in social dossiers, for example, labor mobility, posting of workers. We will devote a lot of attention and time there as regards European pillar of social rights. Estonian presidency is working hard at the Council to be ready for signing the proclamation in the end of this year, in December. Dear ladies and gentlemen, some words, of course, the digital agenda and the dig digital Europe. We are, I mean, Estonia is a small country, but we have the many valuable ideas that we would like to share with all of you with all Europe. This is why we wish to look at our common future together and make the EU a better place to live for everyone. Enlargement and also the, including the Eastern Partnership, both of them, they are important topics during our presidency. 
was the question about the data ownership. I think it is the main question of the free movement of data. And of course, there is no clear answer yet. What is important is that we have clear rules of access, we use and reuse of data. We will start discussions next week, a high-level ministerial conference. Dear colleagues, honorable guests, I want to thank all the members of the Estonian Parliament for their effort in preparing for our EU presidency. I especially recognize that role of the European Union Affairs Committee, its chairman, Thomas Witzut, along with all the professional members of the staff. Despite many difficult issues fighting in EU, we should not forget how positive the European Union actually is. I understand it's maybe quite simple to say on behalf of uh, Estonian government and Estonia that the uh, very strong majority here in our population, they said that European Union is positive, more than 70%, about 77%. And uh, I think also it has given us four great freedoms, the free movement of people, capital, goods and services. Even more, we have Erasmus, cohesion policy, Schengen area and euro currency. The European Union has brought our nations and culture closer than ever. We have to be grateful for all that each day. But I think what is the most important thing that European Union is the most successful peace project in European history. If I may to say, I read that here is six different languages, if I may to say some words in my mother tongue, then you use the, these microphones or It's been an honor for me uh, to uh, speak here in Estonian Parliament in this hall here. I have worked here for about 10 years and quite often when I'm in this hall um, I uh, accepted different excursions from schools, kindergartens and uh, other groups uh, and quite often I asked uh, if you look at the ceiling of this hall then what does it remind you of? This building has been built in 1922 and uh, there have been many different offers, uh, Sydney Opera House, uh, a ship uh, and so forth but the ceiling of this building, designed by the two architects that uh, uh, made the project of this building in 1922, they uh, uh, had the idea that uh, when we uh, reached uh, July the 10th, 2017, and honorable uh, members of the European National Parliament just arrive here, they look at the ceiling and it's supposed to look like a potato field, a field. And uh, the idea was that you have to tend your field well to get a good crop. And I think the same parallel applies to Europe as well. We have to tend to the field quite a lot to reach a good crop and we have to, we can only do this together. We have to work together on this. For your fruitful discussions, I wish you all the best to stay here in Estonia and Thailand. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. During the presidency, also in parliamentary level, we tried to stay as neutral as possible 
I very much hope that Estonia will be able to make important developments on important topics in the EU, launch a debate on the future of the EU and digital matters. Our main goal during EU presidency, as our Prime Minister said, is to preserve the unity of EU. Thank you all for this very interesting debate and now I close this session. Before I let you enjoy the coffee break, let's take the traditional family photo. We will have the photo taken outside from the plenary room on the stairs. The staff will show you the way. And uh, please make sure to be back after 20 minutes at 11.15. traditions and interests in Europe today to achieve the best possible outcome for all European citizens. Although we will be taking forward all the key issues within the EU during our six months, we will focus on delivering most in four priority areas. An open and innovative European economy, a safe and secure Europe, a digital Europe and the free movement of data, an inclusive and sustainable Europe. The European economy has to be open and innovative to stay competitive. An economy can only be successful if it is open to opportunities, change, trade and new ideas. So we will work hard to future-proof the European economy by creating more opportunities for entrepreneurs, making regulations smarter and simpler and developing our greatest joint asset, the single market. must maintain safety and security for all its citizens and play its part in ensuring peace and stability in the world. We will work hard to find new solutions to make the financing of terrorism more difficult, to create databases and IT systems that improve information exchange between the police and security forces of member states, and to strengthen security through even stronger cooperation with NATO and the neighbors of the EU. The future of Europe and the world is digital. This brings great opportunities, but also creates vulnerabilities. Our task and challenge will be to balance the benefits and risks fairly. During our presidency, we will focus on advancing the digital single market, increasing the use of e-solutions and data, and on developing cross-border digital services. We strongly believe this will make the lives of everyone in Europe easier. The EU should be a champion of inclusivity and sustainability. We must re-examine the ways in which we can offer equal opportunities for our citizens who want to live and work across the EU. We need to adjust to changes in the labor market and our working lives. So, we will focus on ensuring equal opportunities for labor mobility within the EU. 
At the same time, we believe economic growth and development should not come at the expense of our natural resources and the world around us. Technology and nature do not need to be opposites. During our presidency, we will work to identify digital solutions and to harness technology for the benefit of our natural environment to preserve what we have today, also for future generations. To find out more about the priorities and plans for the Estonian presidency, visit eu2017.ee. Dear colleagues, I, I hope you all enjoyed your coffee. In this session, we will discuss the European Union's unused potential of startups. It is important to make use of the potential in the field of startups in order to encourage economic growth and enhance the EU's global competitiveness. There is no lack of innovative ideas and entrepreneurial spirit in Europe. However, many new firms do not make it beyond the critical first few years. Therefore, startups are not delivering their full, full innovate, innovation and job creation potential in Europe. According to Startup Hubs Europe, there are more than 800,000 startup companies in the EU, generating more than 420 billion euro in revenue and providing 4.5 million jobs. Let us now share our ideas and best practices. Colleagues, to remind you, you can sign up for the debate already. Let me now introduce our distinguished speakers for this session. First, Ms. Christine Schreiber, Director of COSME, Program and SME Policy, Directorate General for Internal Market, Industry, Entrepreneurship and SMEs, European Commission. Just a second. <laughs> second, Mr. Sten Damgivi, Vice President of Move Kites, which recently acquired Teleport, where Mr. Damgivi was founder and CEO. Third speaker, Mr. Ivo Spiegel, co-founder of Perpento Mobile and the author of the book, The European Startup Revolution. Let us make the best of our time together. We have the excellent opportunity today of a distinguished panel and Cossack chairpersons in the same room. Let's exchange views and discuss the questions we face on this matter. Now, I would like to warmly welcome our first speaker, Ms. Christine Schreiber. Ms. Schreiber, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman, Honourable Members, ladies and gentlemen. You can see how eager I was to come down uh, and how privileged and honoured I feel to be here in uh, this beautiful uh, historical building in Tallinn, in Estonia, as we have already heard. And I think there is probably a very few places which would be as fitting to discuss the topic we're discussing today, because I think we could see already how well Estonia combines 
tradition with new technology. I mean, we had a nice example yesterday evening over the music, uh, and I think, uh, so this is really a great place. Also for me, emotionally, it's always a big, op I mean, a very um, impressive when you have a new member state. I mean, they're no longer that new, but still a new member state having the presidency. I spent five years working with the commissioner on the enlargement negotiation, and I think it's every time very emotional to see uh, the final graduation process, which is the uh, presidency. Um, the Prime Minister spoke about uh, the goals of the Estonian presidency, uh, stressing very much the need to strengthen EU unity and also delivering to our citizens. And I think this panel is really about delivering to our citizens and hence making, I mean, Europe stronger. So this is about the untapped potential in Europe, which we should use. And actually, when we started focusing on startups in the European Commission, a lot of us thought that the issue was really helping companies to get starting in the first place. And we tended to think that we were actually trailing behind the US as far as company creation. And indeed, of course, we could still do more on that. We still hear complaints from entrepreneurs who need to get going fast and cross border from day one and who want one set of rules. But when we looked at the hard evidence through a board consultation with entrepreneurs and startups, what we saw was slightly different. And actually an OECD study confirms this, that there is no major difference between the US and the EU in terms of the creation of startups. What is different is what happens to those new firms. Compared in particular to the US, which we do use as a benchmark, fewer startups survive, especially after two to five years and their growth rate still tends to be much lower. Yet we all know that it's often young, high growth companies that create most of the jobs and growth in Europe. And firms younger than five years account for a higher share of growth and jobs than more mature firms. And by the way, as much as we love the tech sector, in particular here in digital Estonia, studies show that high growth firms are not exclusive to so-called high tech sectors. Instead, they are present in all major sectors of European economies, with a higher share of firms and jobs in services than manufacturing. So we need to do something about, in particular, f uh, the survival rate of companies, the boosting of the number of firms that scale up and their growth rate. And um, that's why we, after the careful consultation we did uh, before our policy initiative, we focused on what we call the startup and scale up initiative, which was adopted last November and which you have seen. Uh, all in all, we have 46 measures in that initiative. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through all the 46 measures. Um, but I would just like to highlight the three major topics we have identified and for which we need your support in terms of implementation. The first issue is finance. So whilst EU startups are able to access finance to get going, companies find it much harder to secure capital as they grow. And I would really like to stress that the COSMO program, for which I'm responsible for, has really done, I think, a great job. We have helped over 175,000 companies in Europe uh, with this loan guarantee scheme, which helps really also small ticket, small companies to set up. So I think there we have been actually quite successful with very tremendous leverage rates. But as I said, we do need um, to improve, uh, especially in the area of venture capital. And there's actually 14 times more capital and venture capital funds aimed at later stage financing in the US and in Europe. So we will have seen that we announced measures including this pan-European venture capital fund of funds, which will hopefully up and be up and running uh, by September. And we are also working on the pilot for the European Innovation Council to make the SME instrument, uh, in which, by the way, Estonia is extremely successful, even more operational and targeted uh, for innovative firms. But and that's the second topic, finance is not enough. Startups and scale-ups need opportunities and partners, investors, business partners, and research partners. So we are developing currently a pilot scheme for matchmaking, where we have actually identified that startups really need to be put in contact with larger mid-caps. I mean, all the large corporates, they do have their own uh, scouts for, uh, for startups, for innovation, but if you take the traditional larger Mittelstand, the mid-caps, they often don't have this capacity and they would gain tremendously in being uh, matched uh, with innovative startups which provide interesting technological solutions. And we're also going to use a lot the Enterprise Europe network 
So I would have a big call to you if you have not been in touch with the Enterprise Europe Network so far in your own countries, please do. They are a great resource um, and a big help and we're actually uh, reinforcing them through scale-up advisors which sort of help individual companies who want to scale up. And we also, of course, have a package of measures with regard to public procurement because if you're a startup and you want to get access to markets, public procurement is a very important market and we need to help startups in this respect. And finally, the third uh, uh, issue we're addressing is removing barriers created by regulation, tax, and of course, bureaucracy. And what we hear from entrepreneurs is that even when they do have access to finance, when they can find the right partners, they are often inhibited from innovating and growing internationally by regulation and sometimes tax rules. And this is, I think, where we can help at EU level, but at the same time, our powers are often limited because labor law and tax are largely of national competence. And on company law and services regulation, we can put down all the, all the proposals we like, but there is no guarantee that we can get them adopted or adopted in a form that will make a real difference for startups. So my plea would also be to you, try to avoid excessive gold plating when we do have legislation in place, because this is often an issue which causes them problems uh, when basically one wants to add additional requirements in the, co in the context of the implementation phase. And it's, of course, very clear that if you are a small company, onerous social security and employment law kicks in once you go beyond a certain size, and attempting to go cross-border often means going through a huge thicket of tax requirements. And again, this is not about avoiding taxes or employment rules, but it's about making sure that we comply with the requirements without excessive bureaucracy. So I think many governments are tackling this now as a priority, and we would really hope to count on your support. So let me conclude by making uh, two points. I think one point is that we have a huge opportunity in Europe. We all look at Silicon Valley in the US, but in the US you have basically Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, and then a few other places where, which are specialized in the Boston New York area. And in Europe we have, as was indicated, a lot of thriving ecosystems, very relevant startup hubs, and I think if we get it right, we can actually become a much more attractive place because our startup hubs are centered around different specializations. Take, I mean, London for FinTech, Berlin for creative industries, and, and so on and so on. So I think this is a huge opportunity which we have to tap in. And also the connecting of ecosystems is, I mean, there I think the role of national and local parliaments is crucial. I can see that I have much, I'm speaking much more about groups of local parliamentarians, which didn't happen in the past, which get interested in this topic and want to link up ecosystems. And finally, I would also like to make a plea that startup policy has to be seen in a broader context. There was often an opposition between startup policy on the one hand and SME policy, which was considered more traditional old fashioned on the other hand. And I think there's a continuum because scale ups can be very innovative, high tech startups, but it can also concern the more traditional SMEs which want to innovate. And I think we really have to look at both of them together because I mean, SMEs, this is a cliche, but it still holds true, are the backbone of our economy. So within this spirit, we are working um, on our startup and SME policy. We will be back in Tallinn in November where we actually combine the two issues with the Startup Nation Summit and our SME Assembly. And that will just be before your next uh, COSAC meeting. So thank you very much for having me here today and I'm looking forward to an interesting debate. Thank you, Ms. Raiba. <coughs> Our next speaker will be Mr. Sten Tamgivi. Mr. Tamgivi, the floor is yours. Esteemed chair persons, delegates, dear fellow Europeans. I stand before you here today because I built companies in Europe. Uh, I founded my first one at the age of 18 here in Estonia. A few, few years later, I had the honor of contributing to the early years of a startup called Skype. And most recently, I sold my latest uh, company, Teleport, to a global tech company called Move Guides. Our team is now working from Tallinn side by side with new colleagues in San Francisco, London, and Hong Kong. All these businesses combine people and technology. In the simplest terms, my job is to bring together the smartest people I can find or afford 
uh, to jointly develop software that we could sell to the world. As the talent required is everywhere, and the markets are global, my work has taken me to live in London, Singapore, and Silicon Valley, yet somehow I'm back here in Estonia building my next great thing. Why? Let me, let me stop on the national level and tell you a little bit about the Estonian experience. Estonia is a nation of startups. First of all, we're tiny. Ratio of Estonia's one million population to the talent pools of Europe, in the US, or especially in, or in India or China, is similar to how a 10-person startup team really feels when you're facing competition with IBM. A village shop against Walmart, one against millions, 10 trying to conquer the billions. But we've treated our size as, a, as an advantage, not a hindrance. Young organisms are hungry because they need energy to grow into big ones. Hunger is what keeps startups going, ignoring the odds and attempting the impossible. Hunger makes you creative, forces you to build with four people what others hire 40 or 400 to build. This is a ruthless process of natural selection, but the companies that make it to the other side are as strong as they come. Per every nine Estonian startup names that you will unfortunately never hear or remember, you will have one Skype or Playtech or TransferWise or Pipedrive or Starship coming out on the other end. With this looming prize in sight, uh, Estonia has the highest numbers of startups per capita in Europe. That means that our tech talent is gathering in small teams trying to create something innovative and new. And just to share some numbers, we have about 400 active startup teams uh, in Estonia. And in 2016, they raised altogether 100 million euros of early stage venture capital. As every entrepreneur knows, investors' capital is not money they earned yet, but the signal of trust to their ability to make money down the line. So think of it as a whopping half a percent of GDP of trust that was lent to these young, unproven teams. 90% of that capital comes from outside of Estonia, which means that we are not redistributing, we're growing. And we're attracting ever so praised foreign direct investment, uh, if you like those terms. And majority of this investment goes directly into people. As I mentioned, it's about technology and people. So our startups employ 2,500 uh, people, which again is tiny to the, compared to the 4.5 European, 4.5 million European number, but it's also about 0.5% of our employment market already. And it's more important that the, these jobs are paid two to three times more than the national average. The payroll taxes contribution last year grew by a third and it continues to do so. So this is Estonia, one of the smallest member states. If you just take just one of those metrics and extrapolate, the 12 billion of venture capital invested in Europe uh, means Estonia is punching about 10 times above the European average weight. How could we close this gap with the rest of the European Union? Supporting technology-heavy entrepreneurship uh, in my opinion, does not have to be shoveling taxpayer money directly into risky tar uh, startups or establishing privileged st status of some companies over the others. Instead, I believe the government's role here is pretty simple. Make a few bets where pooling society's resources is the only feasible way to progress and get out of the way everywhere else. I'll just bring a few examples of each. Where I think the government should lead. Education. A friend of mine once said that you cannot have a world-changing gene technologist become of someone who didn't think that double helix is really cool in fourth grade. There is a baseline of having kids learn math and hard sciences, of course, but it also matters how they learn it. License to be curious and ask questions, build things together, present what they came up with, work with peers across time zones. These are the skills that the kids need to be able to build a tech company later but unfortunately often have to learn on the fly after they get out of the European schools today. Secondly, values, such as openness, diversity, risk-taking. As an example of tolerating risk, an American entrepreneur with a few bankrupt companies on their CV is viewed as a more experienced to start their next company. A similar European is probably more likely seen as an utter failure and shouldn't even be allowed to try again. I also watch with extreme worry the raising voices around Europe calling to close the borders, shut the blinds, and stay indoors, both mentally and physically. Openness, interaction with ideas and peoples different from you, bravely, bravery to deal with uncomfort are the only way we can build global tech companies from Europe. 
We cannot mechanically regulate ourselves to be a free society where startups will strive. We have to be living these values and see visible leadership from people representing us in public, like all of you here. Where the government's role is in removing the red tape and getting out of the way. First, talent mobility. A recent survey by Startup Genome points out that the success rate of approved visa applications for foreign tech workers in Estonia is higher than anywhere else in the world, 84.5%, over two times more than the global 41%. This is where Europe should set the bar. What are the frictions we can remove with targeted innovation programs so that we can invite people who contribute to our startups from anywhere in the world? With top of the world talent, it should not matter where they randomly happen to be born and which passport they happen to have. Secondly, employment regulations. In, most recent, in my most recent startup, we had people working for an Estonian registered legal entity from Munich, Bern, Calgary, Paris, London, and Cambridge. For an entrepreneur, this is a living hell of jurisdictions. Tax regimes, paper forms in all those languages. In this startup story, from inception to exit in three years, I as a founder had even no chance of knowing if we are fully compliant with all cross-border regulations hitting us. The future of work is mobile. The future of team collaboration is fluid, and young professionals can create global value from anywhere they can connect to the internet. Hiring virtual teams across Europe should be, not be any harder than inside one member state, if we're serious about single market. Once work is data, the value that people generate is data. You see how the principle of free movement of data is unavoidable enabling a single labor market as well. In conclusion, please do not think of startups as some isolated subset of economy or a goal in itself. Do you think of startups as pathfinders, the experimenters on the front lines of our future economy? Every barrier that you can remove from the way of startups growing to successful companies and every new step towards increasing the amount of available, available talent on the market are a step closer to the future for which we have equipped with the best knowledge available. General societal goods will stem from supporting the budding startups and the positive effects that quickly spill over to the overall economy and society at large. I wish you strength in enabling such future for Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Damgivi. Now I am delighted to give the floor to Mr. Ivo Spiegel. Mr. Spiegel, please take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to say uh, hello to all of you and thank you for the invitation to this uh, session. I'm used to speaking at many technology conferences, but it's my first time speaking in a parliament, especially in such a beautiful building. Um, I would like to ask a question from the audience now. How many of you love music? Okay, nice to hear. I would like to take you back now to January the 9th, 2001. Uh, this was a date when a software program was launched by an American company called Apple, and the software was called iTunes. The launch of iTunes marked the revolution in the way people around the world enjoyed music as millions of people bought Apple's iPods and listened to uh, music on their iTunes um, on their iPod machines. Today, we don't listen to iPods anymore and we don't use iTunes anymore. We listen to Spotify, Deezer, Last.fm, uh, SoundCloud. All of these companies are European startup successes and digital music is an area where Europe has won on a global scale. European companies are winning in many other areas. In uh, gaming, uh, which is becoming more and more important as an economic powerhouse, they are winning in financial technology, in security, in many, many areas. Uh, I don't know 800,000 European startups, uh, but I have met many, many of them um, on the various conferences and work in my work as a writer. Um, many of them are B2B brands, so they're not maybe so well known to the consumers, but they're creating incredible value have been building fantastic companies from Europe uh, throughout the world. If I look back now, five or 10 years, if we all remember what it was like in 2007 or 2008 for startups in Europe, it was not easy. Uh, there was not uh, support, there was very little funding, uh, there was very little of an ecosystem built in Europe. Today, when we look back, and today when we visit uh, startup capitals like Tallinn, uh, or Berlin, or London, or many other cities, we see the situation has changed dramatically. 
we see that there are incredible opportunities for entrepreneurs to get funded, to get support, to get mentorship, to get advice from people like Stan and many others in the um, startup ecosystem. So Europe has really come a long way, but it's still uh, far from what it could be. And as the title of our session says, there's lots and lots of unused potential in Europe. I think the question for all of you and for all of your colleagues in the national parliaments and the European Parliament and obviously in the various governments is how to unlock that potential. Um, we as entrepreneurs do not look uh, only to the policymakers and to the politicians as being the only ones responsible to do that. European entrepreneurs are also working together um, and in partnership and in communication with the policymakers. But we all should do more and in fact we all should do much more. I believe that amongst European entrepreneurs there is a discussion that is lacking and that is a discussion about how to create a really integrated European startup ecosystem. Today Europe in startup and technology is a collection of little islands like the thousand islands we have in my native Croatia or the thousands I believe that Finland and Estonia also share in their sea. So we have Berlin, we have Stockholm, we have Zagreb, Ljubljana, Tallinn, uh, and all these are city-based ecosystems and the entrepreneurs should come together and discuss how to create a really European ecosystem, integrated, without borders and without any obstructions to the growth of the companies. But we cannot do it alone. We need your help, we need your support, and we need an ongoing dialogue with the policymakers in our continent. Um, there's lots of stuff that governments need to do, as Stan very nicely outlined. Um, this is my first trip um, coming from Croatia internationally where I, had not to, uh, where I didn't have to worry about roaming. So for the first time coming from Zagreb to Tallinn, I could leave my mobile data subscription on, I can call my wife, I can show her a video of the beautiful view from uh, the 22nd floor uh, of my hotel down to the harbor and the ships coming in and out. It took us a long, long time. If I remember correctly, it was first uh, proposed in 2013 uh, to, to eliminate roaming and uh, I'm sure the policymakers had uh, to fight the good fight against the telecommunication companies that really wanted to keep that. It's good to see that we're finally there but there are many many other uh, obstacles and regulations and uh, solutions that we need to find to, uh, to move these companies forward more quickly. Uh, to have them, as uh, my colleagues mentioned, um, be more successful and have a better rate of, uh, better chance of succeeding not only of getting fun founded and getting funded, but also of building and growing and scaling up. Um, it's my belief, and I'm sure you will all agree, that policymakers throughout Europe and European governments need to come together to continue building a framework for a dynamic, innov innovative and digital economy in Europe, um, to realize really the full potential of the technology uh, and the companies te in the technological sector. I think we can all see that in all of our countries, it is these companies, the high tech, the growth companies, that are adding actually the new jobs, that are creating the new value. Um, as your Prime Minister uh, spoke earlier, he referred to this wonderful hall and uh, looked at the ceiling above us and mentioned that it was uh, intended to remind us of a potato field. I have to say I was very surprised, uh, but it's a very interesting remark. Uh, I have to say from my point of view, it looks more like the sky. I feel like it's a metaphor for uh, us being here in the hall and looking up to see where is the limit for our companies and actually the sky is the limit. So we have to understand that the, the entrepreneurs have the shared responsibility, but also you and your colleagues in the national parliaments and the European parliament and in the various governmental organizations and policy making organizations have a huge responsibility. Now, there are many issues troubling Europe at this point and it's not up to me as an entrepreneur to comment very much on Brexit or immigrants or security. However, we ha can offer some solutions in those areas as well. Um, but I think most importantly, um, as you uh, leave today's uh, session and think about what you will share with your colleagues and discuss further, um, I think, I hope that you, and I'm sure that you will be, continue to build a framework where it makes, us, uh, makes, our, uh, makes it easier for our companies to grow and succeed and win on a global scale. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spiegel. Colleagues, now we may move on to the panel discussion. There are a lot of you signed up for the debate. 
Please hold your individual remarks within two minutes. The time will be displayed on the screen. Mr. Edgar Mayer. Thank you, Chair. Well, Estonia enjoys the great reputation of being a digital world power, so uh, I think uh, it's quite apt to put it on this meeting's agenda. We we'll heard about the advantages, and it's about the question as to how to facilitate the setup of a company, and of course, related to that, the question, how can you grow based upon a successful establishment? So that's a big issue, and that's why our government uh, established a package, 185 million billion uh, euros for three years in order to facilitate startup. We had 670 uh, new companies uh, in the past six months, and the 620 of which have already become independent. So there's a couple of issues you can raise. Uh, we uh, take over ancillary uh, wage costs for the companies for three years. We uh, established a one-stop shop for advice and help for these companies. So there's a couple of ways, a couple of things you can do in order to strengthen the startup companies and to actually help them grow and uh, gain a foothold. Um, another issue is important to uh, science. There's a specialist program. Uh, a plus B, it links academia with business, and this is also supposed to, uh, supposed to um, f give new scientific findings uh, in order to improve the situation for startups. So this cooperation actually um, bore fruit in many respects, and we consider it quite successful. We want to continue in this fashion very intensely. We want to further elaborate these opportunities and uh, maybe another figure as far as jobs are concerned. With these new startups, we managed to create uh, 3,400 high quality jobs uh, with these startups, and uh, this is a very important issue. Finally, we should learn from one another. There's a lot of brilliant ideas out there, and these ideas need to be used together with our scientists in order to actually keep pace with other regions of the world. Ms. Jona Solveig Elinar Dotti. Mr. Chair, thank you. I would like to reiterate how much I appreciate the strong focus that the Estonian presidency places on openness, competitiveness and innovation. Three terms so closely intertwined and this cannot be emphasized often enough. We in Iceland are proud to be active participants on EU level and we are actually quite strong when it comes to innovation and particip participation in EU programs in that field. In Iceland we've participated in uh, the COSPE program and moreover we have had 29 participants in the SME instrument whereof projects received grants for the amount of approximately 5 million euros in the field of blue growth, energy, ICT and transport. Also, the startup environment in Iceland has been blooming for the past few years, with gaming being the most prominent field. The largest company by far is CCP Games, which is one of the leading virtual reality gaming companies in the world. Another successful company, Menica, which aims to transform the way banks and advertisers use transaction data, has recently enjoyed a 5.7 million euros investment. It is also important to provide a platform for entrepreneurs and investors to meet. Various startup conferences have been held in Iceland and three accelerators are currently operated. Startup Reykjavik, Startup Energy Reykjavik and Startup Tourism, which nearly 100 companies have benefited from. Other startup companies, both in the gaming and special effects industry, keep growing as well and have picked up seed investment of several million euros. The Icelandic government has made it a priority to establish a good framework for the startup, startup companies to grow. We have increased government funding to the Technology Development Fund, which provides financial support to startups and provided tax incentives both to entrepreneurs and startup investors. All of this said, I must say that I really enjoyed our visit to the Talent Design House yesterday. It was really a clear reminder of how much we can all learn and benefit from each other. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Mr. Richard Herchik. Thank you, the floor, Mr. Chairman. According to the issue on increasing economic and growth and competitiveness in the European Union, I wish to highlight one of the most outstanding recent Hungarian examples, namely the Prezi. The Prezi, which is a famous presentation software company funded by the Hungarian youngsters. In 2014, the Prezi won in the category for the best start-up funder of the Europe ever. Mr. Chairman, I think that the small and medium-sized enterprises and the start-ups are the driving forces of our growth. In this field, we do our best uh, at home to improve business environment, competitiveness, and increase employment by the following means. Just, I would like to mention four points. The first, the Hungarian government wishes to spend 60% of the European Union funds on economic development. Second, the National Competitiveness Council was established in March 2017 with the task of drawing up and re reviving initiatives relevant to the competitiveness of the Hungarian economy. Third, dig digital start-up strategy adopted by the Hungarian government in 2016 is aiming to develop a thriving Hungarian start-up ecosystem by 2020. The strategy is putting emphasis on supporting, for instance, collaboration between multinational industrial companies and the local startup. And finally, Mr. Chairman, as far as the R&D concerned, every year a Hungarian registered company which has real, released meaningful and very profitable innovation in the previous year is honored with the Hungarian Innovation Grand, Grand Prize Exactly 187 were honored with different kind of innovation prizes during the past 24 years. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Baroness Kishwe Faulkner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I found the, uh, Mr. President, I found the speaker's presentations extremely valuable, I should say. They were very interesting. But I noticed three missing words. And they were emerging markets and China. And the fact that we're having this very Eurocentric discussion at the same time that we're talking about scaling up, it seems to ignore the fact that the scaling up is not happening in the EU, it's happening elsewhere. Uh, according to EY, the management consultancy, the largest amount of M&A and venture capital activity in the last year recorded, 2015, was in the US, but with China number two. Even when you look at the United, uh, even when you look at Europe, it is the United Kingdom that leads venture capital, and in all three areas of financing, and your speaker mentioned that, uh, whether it's venture capital, whether it's IPOs or M&A, China is heading into the stratosphere. In 15 years ago, we had a situation where the global firms were in the U.S. and Europe. By 2025 the global firms will be in China. And we have to look at what's happening in terms of financing and the liquidity of deep markets if we're going to address what we do here. It's all very well to talk of SMEs, but until we start growing at least small uni unicorns and helping the unicorns scale up into global firms, we're going to be having a very limited conversation. And let me close, Mr. President, by quoting Angela Merkel in 2013 where she reminded us that Europe has 7% of the world's population, 25% of the world's GDP, but 50% of the world's social spending. I can't see how that sustainable model that everyone is talking about of prosperity and growth is going to happen against this backdrop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Fabian Keller. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Uh, merci de nous permettre de débattre sur... Uh, thank you, President. Thank you for being able to debate uh, about this uh, issue. The Prime Minister, Edouard Philippe, uh, recently visited Estonia. Actually, it was last week that his visit took place um, 
to greet Estonia as the new presidency of the European, of the Council of the European Union, and uh, also to learn from uh, the um, experience of Estonia in the field of e-governance. I would also like to thank uh, Mr. Sten Tamgivi for his presentation today. And the uh, question of attracting talents, that was very interesting uh, to hear about. It seems that Estonia has 10 times more talents than elsewhere in the world. That was quite interesting to hear. But uh, I think uh, these people should be able to develop their companies within the EU. We all know that big American companies uh, follow what's going on on the markets and uh, often uh, swallow up these uh, new innovative companies before they have reached maturity. So I'm uh, very glad to have this uh, discussion here today. We are also uh, following closely what's uh, taking place in the field of uh, digitalization, also in the data strategy of the European Union, also cybersecurity is very important for us. Also everything uh, that um, touches upon digital issues in industry and also what concerns startups is also interesting for us. Uh, research and development. We haven't uh, said much about that. We're talking about uh, self-driving vehicles. And we see that uh, software is being developed in that field. And we see that the European industry has uh, led the way in this field. And the digitalization in, of this field is also very important. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Malik Asman, Asmani. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. First of all, I would like to thank the panel members for their inspiring contributions. It's an important issue for the future of Europe. It's all about innovation, jobs, and to keep our welfare. It's not a question if, but how can the European Union, with a larger market than the US, become more globally competitive in this field? We must also not forget global innovation players as South Korea, China and Japan. They are growing fast, much faster than the European Union. In the Netherlands, we started in 2015 with a special program. It's called the Startup Delta 2020. Former EU Commissioner Ms. Cruz was asked as a special envoy for this program. And since 2016 is our prince. Constantine van Oranje Nassau, the brother of our king, the special envoy. We create, for example, a startup box, an easy access for startups to deal with our government. And we launch also a special program. It's called Costa. It's a platform for startups and big enterprises to meet each other. Also, we create a special startup visa for an easy entrance in the Netherlands. And of course, programs to have an app, easy access to funding. These are only a few examples. Entrepreneurship is very important for the Dutch economy. Amsterdam belongs these days in the top 20 of our world's leading startup cities, and our ambition is to belong in the top five. Our main goal as European Union must be to combat regulatory barriers, also in cross-border situation. And a question for the panel members, can you address us some concrete barriers, the most important in your view, that we must solve? And secondly, we must facilitate access to finance for a startup to become also a scale up in Europe instead of abroad. And this is our future. And when we talk, for example, about the multi-annual financial, uh, financial framework, we must talk about the big I, the I of innovation through our startups. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Sabine. Sorry, Miss Sabine Pierre. Tout d'abord, mes remerciements à la présidence estonienne et euh, aux contributeurs d'aujourd'hui. Le souhait de la présidence. Euh... Thank you. I would like to thank the speakers on the panel today. I can see that for all of you, it is important that uh, uh, the economic growth would. Uh, be re-established in Europe, and I think that uh, that's what the citizens expect from us in France as well. 
our President uh, Macron, only a few days after being uh, um, after taking office, uh, was uh, present at the inauguration of uh, Station F, which is a huge campus uh, where there are lots of um, workplaces uh, and uh, 600 uh, companies uh, can um, exist side by side. And in this context, I would like to draw your attention to uh, the field in which uh, we are leading the way. Um, we find that trust is very important in uh, the processes that take place in the economy. We have to find the balance between the free movement of data and uh, the protection of personal data so that we could protect uh, the privacy of our citizens. Our companies uh, should be able uh, to uh, function in a legally secure um, environment, but also the citizens have to trust this environment. Um, in May 2018, the personal data protection uh, directive will enter into force, but we must remain vigilant and uh, the National Assembly the commission in that assembly takes a close look at the situation. Thank you. Anastasios Kurapis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I would like to thank you and uh, Estonia for the organization of the hospitality. Dear colleagues and uh, ladies and gentlemen, the issue of uh, enhancing startups uh, and scale ups uh, businesses is extremely crucial for the development of the economy of the European Union in the coming year. As far as I am concerned, I would like to refer to some elements concerning Greece. The Greek economy is characterized by a very high level of knowledge and an extremely strong human capital with very high technological skills. This background has pushed the development of new entrepreneurship over the past years but the key challenge is the one that outlined by the European Commission, durability and steady growth. At this level, it is necessary to develop financing tools that will support startup companies in three fields in Greece, agricultural production, tourism, and the social economy. As far as the agricultural sector is concerned, innovative entrepreneurship can provide solutions in critical area, areas ranging from natural source, source management, from smart watering technologies, for example, to promote products in new markets. In the tourism sector, there is a huge scope for developing new platforms to promote Greek tourism and cross-border cooperation with neighboring countries with the aim of creating cooperative tourist platforms. Finally, especially in the social economy, Greece and the Greek economy are facing new challenges such as the social inclusion of refugees and in this context, the involvement of civil society and the private sector in the social economy is increasing. New entrepreneurship can fill gaps in traditional state interventions and work complementarity in the field of social solidarity. Finally, creating a fiscal space for lower taxes for startups is an important factor for growth in this field of the economy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Mr. Christian Vikenin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I would like to first to thank the panelists for the interesting contributions that they've made. Uh, I think it's a very timely discussion and thank you, Chair, for putting that on our agenda because in the past we thought that uh, this type of policies are reserved for us, but we see increasing competition by other centers of growth. So we need really to push in, the, in this area in order to keep our competitiveness. Um, I have a question or rather a comment to Mrs. Schreiber. Uh, there is something that I, I, I missed in, in your presentation and generally about the policy that you presented because I think that uh, uh, one of the important elements in order to be successful with these policies it is to have a stronger link uh, with the education of the young people. 
Even the most talented and bright people need specific, specific skills in order to uh, use and make profit of the, of the policies that we are proposing and are going to implement. That's one element. Uh, the second element, I think, uh, developing our policies, we have to take into account uh, also the specific situation in the different countries. Um, because, uh, of course, some general rules uh, will be uh, beneficial for everyone within the European Union, but at the same time, uh, we see some uh, differences between countries. Uh, I could generalize less developed, more developed, and also some differences uh, uh, internally between the different regions. So we need to, I think, on one hand, to give more flexibility to countries to uh, adapt these policies, uh, and um, uh, to take into account the fact that uh, at least there's the situation with Bulgaria, a lot of bright, talented young people, they simply uh, go to the more developed Western countries where they have, uh, or they think they can find better opportunities to develop their skills and make use of that. So uh, uh, this link between the policies that you've mentioned and the education and the policies that can uh, keep those young people back in our country should be very much interlinked in order to be successful. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mireille McInnes. Thank you, Chair, and my thanks to the uh, three very concise presentations. Um, I think that we need to look at the background where startups and scale-ups are taking place. We're talking about the circular economy, we're talking about valuing natural capital, um, and climate change. And I think there is a, a, an opportunity for um, investment in these areas, startups and scale-ups. The second observation is around education, and it's already been mentioned. Do we educate um, young people to be open or to be looking for a fixed job, uh, a certainty? And, and I think that's a member state competence, but Europe can pro provide some guidance on that. Access to finance is absolutely crucial. Um, and I still think there are differences both in the cost of finance across Europe and indeed ready availability of finance. And we need to look beyond the current banking system to allow these uh, entrepreneurs to not just start up but also to scale up. I think, for example, there are um, good role models to use, like for the med tech sector, where the medical profession, hospitals work with uh, universities and with the industry because they can innovate together to find solutions uh, for health um, uh, uh, area uh, where individually they would not be as effective. So I think that collaboration is absolutely key. Uh, but in terms of uh, the scale-up part of it, there is no doubt, I do believe China is making a very deliberate effort to draw the best from the world uh, to their startups and scale-ups and I think Europe needs to respond. But the climate is more confident than it was, as, as was mentioned, in 2007 and 2008. And we need a good uh, air of confidence and a can-do attitude for entrepreneurs to take up the challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the panelists for very interesting uh, uh, presentations. Uh, the, uh, first of all, I wanted to share some of the experience from Georgia on the issues that were raised. Uh, for us, it was important to um, contribute to developing, uh, cr to creating an open investment climate in Georgia, and for this, we have undertaken several measures. Um, we have uh, lowered taxes, we have simplified uh, and reformed customs practices. Of course, we have tackled corruption, uh, we have made property registration easier, um, we have uh, addressed uh, legislative gaps in many areas such as insolvency uh, legislation for example, uh, and we have invested in infrastructure development. What, through the results, through the uh, measures that have been implemented, Georgia now ranks uh, 16th in uh, ease of doing business in the world, and it is second in its income group. Uh, we uh, take actions dedicated to uh, developing entrepreneurship uh, 
through um, advancing, uh, through actually establishing new enterprises, through advancing existing ones and promoting entrepreneurial culture in general. Estonia has been a good model for Georgia in many ways, and it has been a good model, uh, I knew this uh, before, in that, uh, for uh, reforming our taxation system. We have recently introduced a new system through which uh, we uh, do not tax uh, the uh, undistributed profit of the companies, and this is something that is to generate more uh, employment opportunities and growth of enterprises, we believe. Uh, but it has also been a good model for us in terms of uh, putting, investing in startups. And I found that out yesterday when uh, you had a very nice visit organized to the uh, Estonian Design House. The idea that we have also developed is similar to what was presented here in Estonia, where we also have business incubators and where our government invests in new um, companies uh, through mentorship and through uh, uh, education, of course, which is also very important for promoting economic opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Poland greatly appreciates the initiative of the European Commission in the area of start-ups. The program titled Start in Poland covers a range of initiatives taken by the Polish government addressed to start-ups who locate their business in Poland. At the moment, it is the largest start-up program in Central and Eastern Europe. The budget of the program amounts to almost 3 billion Polish slotties, and it is assumed that this program will contribute to creating 1,500 companies in Poland within the next seven years, which will foster innovative technologies. Companies covered by the program will receive support not only at the incubation and acceleration phase, but also will receive support aimed at ensuring their development and their international expansion. This is the goal of our Deputy Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki. So the program Start in Poland strengthens uh, the plan for responsible development, we adopt acts which remove barriers to innovativeness. We have drafted the Constitution of Business, a new act which forms the regulatory framework for pursuing business in Poland. But we also want to encourage Poles to return to Poland, and we want to attract foreigners to register their companies in Poland and to capitalize on the developments of research in Poland. That is why we, wa we are drafting the component of Poland Price. We will help foreigners legalize their stay in Poland and move their companies to Poland. The program also provides mentoring on business and assistance in creating comprehensive offers for investors. So Poland is heavily investing in startups. Ms. Marianne Mikko. Thank you very much. I'm using this opportunity to speak in my own parliament hall, to speak in Estonian as I always do. I wish to speak in Estonian here in Cossack as well. I am very pleased about uh, our discussion today, both uh, during the first half of the day when the Prime Minister spoke to us, uh, but also right now, uh, uh, Mrs. Schreiber, Mr. Tamgivi, Mr. Spiegel spoke to us and the presentations were all great. But regardless of that, I would come back uh, to the question posed during the first half of the day posed by our president, uh, our, our prime minister, the uh, free movement of data. In Estonia, it is quite natural for us that m many services that we uh, use uh, in our everyday life uh, go through the internet. So the free movement of data in Estonia, not only in Tallinn, but also in other smaller locations, it's uh, it, 
clear to us, inevitable, but uh, here in the hall, we uh, uh, heard these thoughts that in case of free movement of data, who uh, has the ownership priority and isn't it dangerous? What happens to the data? And that's why I would be very happy if uh, our three great uh, presenters would answer from their own perspective uh, what would happen to the free movement of data if it became one or the fifth freedom of uh, the European Union. And another small question that uh, kind of stuck with me when Mrs. Schreiber said that uh, unfortunately in Europe uh, we do not have this kind of place as uh, Silicon Valley is in the United States. So my question is to Sten Damgivi, what would happen and would it be conceivable, would it be good, should there be a Silicon Valley type uh, uh, place or location in Europe? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Paolo Casado. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I really agree with uh, President Juncker when he said after Bratislava summit that he would prefer talking about a better Europe rather than a, just more Europe. So I think uh, for this kind of economy debates, uh, let me state just three ideas. First of all, competitiveness. Uh, I remember the Lisbon agenda when we said several years ago that Europe couldn't compete demographically nor militarily, but we should compete in the economic field. I think for that we should have enough flexibility, free trade, and also a uh, lack of fiscal and bureaucratic barriers. Second of the ideas, innovation. We want to be only consumers of new products, of new technology, or also producers. Years ago, Nokia was the world leading company in cell phones and also our car manufacturer companies. Now all the software companies are abroad, are in the United States or in Asia. And the third of the ideas is anticipation. Uh, the previous three industrial revolution produced social disruptions, but the, 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 the net result were positive. So in this uh, fourth uh, revolution, we're talking a lot about self-driven cars, but maybe we're not talking about how many millions of jobs are gonna be destroyed. So I think we should anticipate all these debates and only uh, with this way of facing this digital revolution, we should be able to afford our welfare state and our own security. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Now I pass the floor to our speakers for remarks on the debate. Ms. Schreiber, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you to uh, everyone first for sharing the different national experiences which are um, extremely valuable. Some of them were already well known to us, others I discovered today, so this is very useful uh, insight. And thanks, of course, for your all your different uh, suggestions. Let me, of course, I will not reply to all points made, but let me just react uh, to a couple. Um, one issue which came up in several interventions was the need to look at the future and at the next uh, financial perspectives. And I think here it's really important, that's why I would also, I mean, in this context where national parliaments are present and you obviously have a strong uh, influence and impact on the preparation of these debates, that we really look what we want in the next uh, uh, financial perspectives. If we want to have a focus on innovation, and here I think really innovation in the broad sense, I mean, helping our future unicorns, startups, but also helping, I would say, more traditional companies. And I'm picking up a comment maybe from, you know, Bulgaria or Greece, um, we, need, we need both. We need to help also the more traditional ones to, 
to uh, find ways of becoming more innovative and competitive. So if that's a priority, we should make sure that this is also reflected uh, in the future uh, perspectives. And we, I mean, I personally think that uh, the focus to have a particular SME focus for the first time in a program was actually useful and has delivered uh, results. But so this will stay with us in terms of, on terms of debate. Um, then uh, let me mention education skills and let's say general life competences which were mentioned. Of course, this is absolutely crucial. I mean, I try to focus on those areas where we have a direct impact. I mean, we have a lot of recommendations that our colleagues uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in um, responsible for the education area are doing, I think, tremendous work. Don't forget, I mean, Erasmus was quoted here. We also have Erasmus for Young Entrepreneurs, which I think is a small contribution to this uh, mindset. But fundamentally, I mean, we push uh, particularly for uh, what you call the MINT or STEM uh, competences in national curricula, but you know this is a national competence, so basically we can push and encourage, but this is not directly uh, within our remit. And for the general life competences, I would say, um, very important, uh, this issue of failing. I mean, when my, my son actually studied in the U.S., and he, when he, in the graduation speech, the... Um, uh, this, the uh, director said, you know, don't worry if you fail. Failing is a first attempt in learning, and then you stand up again. And I think this is really something uh, where we can learn, and then we have to help entrepreneurs to stand up again. And one thing is mentality, I mean, risk culture, but another thing is also to have the right legislative context. And we're actually working uh, on improving our insolvency law that an honest entrepreneur can start again and is not sort of penalized for a long time and on the second chance regime, as we, as we call it. Um, I do think that we're actually quite local in our approach. I mean, I tried to mention that actually, I think it's our asset that we don't have one Silicon Valley but that we do have lots of regional hubs. And I mean, also back to the Bulgarian question, I think every uh, regional hub is specialized in a certain area which fits in the, in the local context. And so I, that's, I think, our, our, an important aspect. And uh, in my view, if we manage to, e to connect the ecosystems well, then we will also stop this brain drain which you mentioned, because then it's actually much easier to stay in Bulgaria, or I mean, Estonia is a proof for that. You're not exactly a very centrally located country, but very, very active in terms of, the, uh, in terms of all the interaction. And f just a final comment on data. I think this will be greatly discussed uh, next week at the Informal Council of Ministers. So um, I think as for all, I mean, if I can just make a general remark, as for all freedoms, you need some balances, and I think one of some of the issues were already touched upon, but it's obviously, I mean, one of the crucial issues, I think, in the context of the digital single market review, and that will be a big debate, uh, I think, next Monday in Tallinn. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tam, give it the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the discussion that, uh, that we've heard. Um, I picked up three themes or three points to comment on. Uh, first of all, uh, this team, the representative of the United Kingdom, brought up the topic of Asia um, and less lack of mentioning China and India. Uh, I, think, um, I think the chance for Europe there is to monitor the, the talent flows carefully. Like that this picture has been changing, the race of Asia in the last few years, India producing more software developers than the population of Estonia a year. Like, like this, this has happened over the last few decades. And we can um, probably the easiest way to monitor is not to monitor this current state, but monitor the dynamics, dynamics happening. You see the uh, American Indians going home to support companies there with capital and talent. You see Ch uh, Chinese Americans going home doing the same. Uh, at the same time, you have a flow of people that used to go from uh, developing markets to the US, to the innovation hubs, which uh, I read yesterday that the, the current uh, U.S. President is planning to stop the laws uh, or the changes around entrepreneurial visas. So I think that's a huge chance for Europe to see how can we pick up uh, these things that used to happen in U U.S. but are not anymore, or at least are getting harder. Um, secondly, the question of should Europe have a Silicon Valley, my position always has been on that, that uh, we don't need more Silicon Valleys. I always. Uh, smirk when somebody says that we're Silicon Valley of something, Estonia is the Silicon Valley of the Baltic Sea or the North or whatnot. It's not. Um, 
how startups work is that you, when you go against any incumbent in any industry, in order to win with the lack of resources in starting up, you have to be 10 times better. You have to find that one thing where you're 10 times better. If you start the game by trying to be another Silicon Valley, you're by definition going to fail because you maybe you're going to be 10 percent better or something or you can't build Silicon Valley in, the, in their own game like like that's a 40 50 years of history of developing consumer software and silicon chips and things that, that absolutely if you're doing some of those things you should go and establish your company in Silicon Valley there are many things that you can't do there like you, if you want to build a company that deals with Bitcoin and drones you will not put it in Mountain View because you can't fly drones and the regulation around Bitcoin is unclear you're not going to put it in New York because you can't fly drones in Manhattan. So what about biotech? What about cryptocurrencies? What about e-residences? Like, uh, these are the things gaming was mentioned before. Uh, mobile gaming especially has not been because of the development of the mobile industry in the U.S. has been different. It's not started there. So, so Finland and Japan and Iceland and, and, and uh, these beautiful countries uh, around the world are, are doing much better there. So I think for our chance there is to figure out which are the places where we can naturally be 10x better in something. And I believe Europe has many cities and more than one city that, that will have that one thing where they will rule uh, and then establish or uh, help the companies in that field to be established there. And lastly, um, the free movement of data. My personal, personal position there is that it, probably the sensible thing to do there is to start unpacking it from the consumer point of view. And the premise there is that um, software is eating the world as uh, my friend Mark Andreessen uh, postulated. Um, and that means that everything that used to be done with mechanical engineering or specialized hardware or devices that do one thing is over time moving towards being enabled in software. So the hardware underneath is getting generalized and there is more software that can be customized and applied to different use cases. It was mentioned here, self-driving cars. That's a great example of that. Cars used to be pretty specialized pieces of equipment. Now it's four wheels, four electric engines, and a bunch of software. So I believe Tesla, at some point, it was like between a third and a half of the engineers employed by the, the fastest growing car company are software engineers. If things are built with software, they contain data. So we should look at free movement of data. What are the things that consumers naturally expect to do that we shouldn't be blocking with regulation? If somebody drives a car from Tallinn to Paris, if the car contains data and the car is connected to the cloud, like if we don't solve free movement of data, that car can't cross borders anymore. It will start violating data laws. And uh, try explaining that to a European consumer or European citizen why that happened now. So I think there are simple use cases that you can come up, people traveling with their mobile phones, people traveling uh, uh, with their self-driving cars or even, even cars they still love to drive, uh, people flying from European cities to another, people storing their files in clouds that they don't have any reason to know where they are. Like, who, why would a consumer know where would the files live in a cloud environment? And, uh, and just going through those use cases and seeing what we can do to enable those, I think is a good start for, for the free moment of data discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spiegel. The Thank floor you. is yours. It was uh, very interesting to hear all the opinions and, and the feedback, and I'm personally grateful to, to, to get all those views. Um, obviously, it's a short time, so we can't go into depth on any of the uh, issues. Uh, one of the uh, questions that was asked by a gentleman from the Netherlands was uh, about what are the most important obstacles. Uh, again, not that much time, but simply let's think about how easy it is to set up a company anywhere in Europe, to hire talent from anywhere in Europe or the world uh, for the best people to come to that company, and how easy it is to sell to consumers and businesses um, around Europe and around the world. Uh, it's not the same if you're doing all of that in a national economy or in Europe. So uh, what we all need to push towards together is to make that as simple and as easy uh, as it is in doing it in a, in a single economy. Uh, on the issue of Asia and China, um, Yes, the, the best European startups are global companies. They're expanding globally, and we have uh, so many examples. I will just name uh, Supercell from Finland um, as a company that has established a strong position in Japan and China as well. Uh, or we can think of another company called TradeShift, which is a B2B um, uh, supply chain management company that started out of Denmark, uh, today has office in, in Silicon Valley, and is also strongly expanding 
I believe that European entrepreneurs uh, often have a cultural advantage uh, moving into Asia and China over their American rivals and, and competitors uh, simply because of the uh, global outlook of European entrepreneurs. But yes, definitely, uh, we, this is something that we need to encourage all of our startup founders to think globally from day one and not just focus on expanding from Europe to the US. Uh, the data flow issue is obviously critical. It's not the only concern. There are further concerns around AI, robotics, um, and you know, self-driving vehicles and all that, IoT. Um, there's no simple answer. These are not simple or trivial issues. They're complex uh, issues, but I think it's very important that we understand them, that we address them as an as a ecosystem, as a group of entrepreneurs and policymakers, and obviously look for solutions uh, where they are best uh, where, where there are some best practices being already put into place on the ground. Uh, around Silicon Valley, I agree completely with STEM, and I think that's a, that's a consensus among uh, all of us who are kind of commenting and writing about what's going on in European technology. Um, obviously, Silicon Valley is not the only tech center in the U.S. Uh, other cities in the United States are competing, such as Boston, New York, and Austin, and Dallas, and many others. Uh, similarly, uh, in, in Europe, uh, there are many uh, great cities uh, building uh, high-tech uh, ecosystems. Um, Paris, clearly with Station F, uh, being run by my, my friend Roxanne Barza, and obviously London and uh, Stockholm and many others. Uh, but the opportunities today in Europe are not necessarily tied to all the great tech hubs. We have a, currently, it seems, very spectacularly successful um, startup in the, in the vehicle space in Croatia called Rimac Automobili. Uh, they are building the most powerful electrical supercar in the world, which costs 1 million euros and has 1,000 horsepower in these four electrical motors. Um, now, if you look at Croatia as a likely hub or likely center for something like that to create, uh, we have zero industrial legacy, we have zero heritage in car production or very little in mechanical engineering, engineering but it did not stop that one entrepreneur called Mate Rimac to now have a company of 200 people with a significant investment coming from China, uh, but also from other parts of the world. So uh, technology and the digital economy enables our entrepreneurs to build their companies basically anywhere. So I think it's up to us. It was great to hear all the national initiatives, the uh, startup in Poland and the other uh, Netherlands and all of those. Um, and those are all great and fantastic for the founders. I believe we need many more and many stronger and more ambitious and more aggressive pan-European initiatives like that. Simplifying the rules, pushing the startup founders, not worrying about whether they're going to stay in Europe or go somewhere else. If they expand globally, they will have to have an office in Hong Kong and San Francisco and other places. And whether the founders have moved there or not is not so important. Uh, many of the tech teams will remain in Europe. They will be in Zagreb, they will be in Ljubljana, they will be in Tallinn. Uh, and they will create wealth and taxes and, uh, and revenue for the countries to build more of their um, infrastructure and education and everything else that's needed for the startup founders. So, um, so yes, uh, do we need to win in China? We definitely do. Uh, do we need to consider very carefully all the controversial issues? Yes, we do. Uh, we as entrepreneurs are always at your disposal. Uh, to uh, help you understand the issues perhaps sometimes better, uh, to discuss at the table uh, in this grand environment or maybe in smaller sessions um, what we feel are the best uh, steps to take forward. So as I said before, I'm very much looking forward to basically continue discussion um, around all these topics throughout Europe. Thank you, distinguished speakers and colleagues for for a very fruitful and uh, interesting discussion. I think it's very important to take full advantage from this unused potential in the field of startups. It's good to hear that there are also numerous initiatives taken on member state level making their startup ecosystems more competitive. We should definitely continue the work on EU level to remove barriers for startups to scale up in the single market. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you all for attending the meeting and for 
your active participation. Furthermore, I would like to thank all the people involved